Hey, welcome. Esoteric Duvidism here again. I'm going to be talking more about consciousness today. I really enjoy doing this. I've personally been gaining quite a bit out of doing this. I hope I can help develop an audience and you know some sort of community around trying to understand these ideas. And really, I think I have enough information here that it really might be like a week. I mean, uh, I, I've been watching, I've been saying this my whole adult life. I've taken many advanced university courses in the subjects. I've been listening to lectures and the most conferences, uh, you know, hundreds of books on the subject. You know, I just uh, got this book in today, just ordered this on uh, private speech, executive function, and the development of verbal self-regulation. I studied linguistics in university. And, you know, so on, so on. The subject is extremely interesting to me. To me, I always researched it just because I wanted to know. I never knew I was going to go anywhere with this or move into research. Um, but I've been studying for like 20 years, so I, I think I know enough to put out at least a series of videos. And uh, if anyone saw my speed reading, I'm using some of these techniques, memory learning technique that I've learned in my later age to try to build a framework reference so I'll be able to learn more. My father has huge library, thank God. And uh, he has a lot of these classics, the science classics, medicine ca uh, classics, you know, the famous books that were written by the people who developed uh, science today, hundreds of books on the subject. And I'd like to be able to read through it, get through it, just, uh, just a private interest, let alone, you know, to move forward medicine or advancement if I would ever have my own theory, just because I find it interesting. So in that respect, uh, even if no one were to watch these, these videos are worthwhile just for myself to do. I hope they're beneficial to other people too. And, uh, you know, be involved in the chat and hopefully you'll have, have discussions or I could bring on guests to talk through some of this stuff. But, uh, you know, right now I just need to put in my own head and the people are watching this, the proper outlook for looking at this stuff, the proper uh, framework uh, to know the proper scientific terms. I'd like to get into more esoteric subjects. And, uh, you know, in order to do that, I want to know what the current state of science is, what the current state of knowledge is, what uh, researchers are researching. I have up here, you know, the Science of Consciousness Conference. I watched the whole last year, this year, you know, tens of hours of the most recent reports on things related to the brain and consciousness. Very interesting. Okay. So let's jump right into uh, some slideshows and uh, a lot of information today. So you know, we're going to be talking relatively the, the brain, you know, pretty clear the brain works for perception and motor control and uh, you know, so a lot of the history of science on cognition is specifically related to sensation and perception. So we have psychophysics, the absolute threshold and difference. So sensations, the input of sensory information, processing of receiving, converting, and transmitting information from the outside world. We have vision, hearing, smell, taste, balance, kinesthetics, touch, vision, visual receptor cells located in the retina, rods for night vision, cones for color vision. Eye captures light and focuses it on the visual receptors, which convert light energy to neural impulses sent to the brain. And this is about as basic as could get. As you see, we're going to get into the most recent uh, scientific discoveries on this. So we re really want to uh, ground this these simple concepts in. So hearing, Audition hearing occurs via sound waves which result from rapid changes in air pressure caused by vibrating objects. Interesting, the air, ear is a mechanical device that forms a Fourier transform. Receptors located in the inner ear, cochlea, tiny hair cells that convert sound energy to neural impulses sent along to the brain. You have smell and taste, olfaction receptors located on the top of the nasal cavity, uh, gustation taste receptors, and our taste buds on the tongue, four basic tastes, sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. In the body senses, uh, vestibular sense, the sense of balance results from receptors in the inner ear. Kinesthetics, body posture, orientation, body movement results from receptors in the muscles, joint, and tendons. 
Skin senses detect touch, pressure, temperature, and pain. Processing, sensory reduction, filtering and analyzing a sensation before messages are sent to the brain. Transduction, process of converting receptor energy into neural impulses the brain can understand. Adaption, decreased sensory response to continuous stimuli. Psychophysics, study the relationship between the physical properties of the stimuli and a person's experience of them. Absolute threshold, minimum amount of energy we can detect. And the difference threshold, the smallest change in a stimulus we can detect. Perception, a constructive process by which we go beyond the stimuli that are presented to us and attempt to construct a meaningful situation. Perceptual processing, you have top-down perception is guided by higher level knowledge, experience, and expectations and motivations, and bottom-up perception that consists of recognizing processing information about the individual components of the stimuli. So com key concepts for perception is selection, organization, interpretation, subliminal uh, perception, and uh, ESP, extrasensorial per uh, perception. So selective attention, feature detectors, and habituation, organization, your form, the gestalt, constantly, constancy, like shape, size, color, and brightness, depth, and color, gestalt principles, rules that summarize how we tend to arrange bits and pieces of information into meaningful holes, and gestalt psychology, form, and constancy, size, shape, color, brightness. So through interpretation, your ad adaption, set, individual motivation, frame of reference, subliminal perception, stimuli that can occur below the threshold of any conscious awareness, but have a weak, if any, effect on the behavior. An extra sensory perception, ESP, alleged perception in the absence of sensory data, like telepathy, precognition, clairvoyance, and psychokinesis. So pretty simple stuff. Um, you know, good to review, you know, saying we'll start pretty simple and, uh, you know, it's going to get pretty complicated extremely quickly. So let's do a, a, another simple one on the senses. So just a quick overview of the senses. This one could almost be like high school, but it's got some nice, uh, Graphics and you're saying the key thing consciousness is you know, the main thing we're conscious of is sense perception And for the brain we're going to be trying to understand You know how this sens uh, sensory perception data is converted into either the soul as the brain as a receptor or Into thinking and the connection to memory as seen by the most latest evidence of the brain that we'll be getting into obviously the sense of touch the skin, skin forms as a protection of the body from infection, injury, loss of water, maintains the body temperature, regulate body temperature through perspiration, um, allows us to feel warmth, cold, and other sensation. Nerve endings of the skin can tell you if something is hot, cold, smooth, or rough. They can also feel if something is hurting you. Body has about 20 different types of nerve endings that all send messages to your brain. You have three layers of the skin, the epidermis, the outer layer of the skin, tough protective outer layer. It is about as thick as a sheet of paper over most parts of the body, constantly flaking off and being renewed. In the dermis, the middle layer containing nerve endings, blood vessel, oil glands, sweat glands. In subcutaneous, the bottom layer, mostly fat, Helps the insulation, the body stay warm, absorb shock. Each hair in your body grows a tiny tube in the skin called a, fo a follicle. Every follicle has its root way down in the subcutaneous layer and continues up through the dermis. Some more pictures. Um, some of you hopefully have learned this quite in depth. So, onto the tongue, sense organ for flavor. It's grooves, grooves contain buds which are taste receptors. Sensory cell within the receptors feeds back to the brain. So the tongue moves and pushes a small bit of food along with cell live into your esophagus, 
which is a food pipe that leads from your throat to your stomach. The top of your tongue is covered with a layer of bumps called papillae. Papillae help grip food and move it around while you chew. They contain your taste buds so you can taste everything. So flavoring chemicals and food dissolve in the saliva, stimulates the taste buds that send messages to the brain. Messages are sent to the brain that give us the taste of the food. There are four kinds of taste bud, sweet, sour, salty, and bitter. Each kind of taste bud is not evenly distributed on the tongue. The certain parts of the tongue are more sensitive to a particular taste than others, as seen in the diagram. Sweet at the tip of the tongue, sour and on the back side, salty on the front sides, bitter in the way back. The nose, smelling. Nose is the sense organ that detects smell. Millions of small smell receptors inside our nose. So also part of eating, because uh, you know the nose is internal within with the connected, so that we gain quite a bit also from smelling our food. So when we breathe, some chemicals enter our nose. Chemicals dissolve in the mucus, stimulate the smell receptors to produce messages. Messages are sent to the brain to give us the odor of the food. Smell and taste detect the flavor of the food. ear hearing also balance is in the ear so the ear lobe and the canal the ear lobe collects the sound waves and the canal passes the waves through to the eardrum the eardrum membrane that vibrates and the ossicles the small bones that help carry the sound waves hammer anvil and stir up and the cochlea the coil tube of the inner ear snail shape filled with liquid and hair like cells The semicircular canal, these small tubes in your ear, which control your balance, and the auditory nerve carries impulses from the ear to the brain. You got the eye, the cornea, transparent coating, which covers the iris and the pupil at the front of the eye, and the iris, the color part of the eye that regulates the amount of light entering the eye, and the pupil, the opening at the center of the iris, and the lens, the clear part of the eye behind the iris that helps to focus the light or an image on the retina. And then you have the retina, the light sensitive tissue lining at the back of the eye. The retina cover converts light into electric impulses that are sent to the brain through the optic nerve. And the optic nerve is a bundle of more than one million nerve fibers that carries visual messages from the retina to the brain. You know, that a million nerve fibers. Okay, so now pretty basic. So uh, and keep on going with this. You know, a lot of these are, are pretty simple. And my goal is to, uh, you know, hope to build community around these uh, intellectual endeavors and, uh, you know, review this stuff and help, uh, you know, eventually move into these esoteric concepts and consciousness because I think... In reality, is that esoteric concepts are actually probably more complicated than uh, the scientific subjects. But uh, certainly in these days, empiricism and scientific evidence that we need to uh, have the scientific background to know what's out there. And so obviously sense perception is one of the key things related to con consciousness. And uh, yeah, I appreciate people watching me and staying in the chat room. And, uh, you know, as I said, I, I want to create this intellectual community around these different topics, and some topics I talk about might be more interesting than others. And so I, I appreciate the community we're developing around this. So let's keep it going. I'm going to open up a few of these here at once and go through quite a f go through a few of them, and 
appreciate your patience. Sorry to have dead space. It's not good to have dead time on the, but you know, these are largely just all me talking. So uh, I gotta take a break, space myself. Oh, we got a minion. Awesome. Okay, so I prepared some good stuff. You're like, I've really been working hard. I want to make good content. So let me just make sure my sound is working. I'm really happy I got a whole minion here watching. So let's keep keep at it. Okay, college biology course on cognitive neuropsychology and cognitive Cognitive neuropsychology of language. So I'm just saying consciousness, you gotta know all the things that the brain does, all the things that the mind does, and really try to understand. And as I said, I believe we could increase intelligence. So what is uh, cognitive neuropsychology? You have the history of phrenology and localization, recovery of functional following function following damage, mapping the brain and cognitive neuropsychology of language, so you know, discovery of Broca's area, and aphasia in Wernicke's area. So cognitive neuropsychology is the study of the relationship between brain function and behavior, especially as determined through evidence from damaged brains, but can include other methods like imaging, and you know, God forbid, you know, the most of the evidence comes from, God forbid, horrible freak accidents that happen to people, you know, bullet wounds, cancer, impact accidents, um, surgery, epilepsy, different diseases, strokes. So unfortunately, a lot of the data that we have for how the brain operates is from when something goes wrong. And as I said, we do not have a working theory. I, I read to you yesterday at length the oscillation theory and possibly different ideas for uh, how the brain could take all of these sense information data and create what we call consciousness. But as of now, the understanding of how the brain is involved in it is largely due from <coughs> imaging and freak accidents. So we've got tumors, impact uh, wounds, So, you know, people trying to think that the brain function is localized or modular with different structures performing different roles. Uh, most, many functions rely on distributed brain systems like language, memory, use most of the brains, although they might use more percentage-wise certain parts of it. Brain regions are specialized to perform particular roles, but these may not help neatly onto our ideas of brain function. So a little bit of history, gall, spurzyme, trying to understand why certain uh, people might have had good memory or uh, different types of thinking. And he you know, thought that these students may have had these large protruding eyes and he developed a theory of brain function called localization of function. Different parts of the brain are responsible for variations in individual differences. And hence, like phrenology, people who've had skills in math, music, sense of color, combative, and they have bumps in certain parts of their head, depressions in the skull, and uh, you know, this was referred to as phrenology that was pretty popular for a period of time. It was you know, eventually declared as quackery. So you have Pierre Florenz, famous uh, physiologist. Magandy presented the brain of Laplace. Spurzheim had the very natural wish to see the brain of the great man to test the science of the phrenologist. Mr. Magendee showed him, instead of the brain of Laplace, that of an imbecile, Spurzheim, who had already worked up his enthusiasm, admired the brain of the imbecile as he would have admired that of Laplace. Then uh, Florence also conducted experience on lesion parts of the cortex of different animals behaved you know, um, movement recovery of function pattern of loss of recovery seemed inconsistent with the assumption of localization so lesions to parts of the brain stem could cause permanent breathing difficulties the cerebellum loss of locomotion uh, coordination then you had Broadman's area discovered in 1909 appearance of the cortex under the microscope 
uh, your Broadman's area map neatly to psychological functions, partly. And, you know, this nice diagram connecting uh, <coughs> different parts of the brain to vision, some uh, some amount of sensory, motor, auditory, emotion, cognitive memory, language, olfactory, and others unknown. The uh, Jean Baptiste uh, Bulliard proposed that certain functions were localized, you know, um, in noting differences between damage in the left and right hemisphere, uh, possible damage to writing. His son also further cases of these studies, and you had Broca, like from Broca's area, received the pa uh, pa patient, uh, Mansir Ten Le Leborgnin, could only say Ten and utter an oath. See so different historical cases that led to the development of uh, brain theory. Tan died in 1861. Autopsy revealed a lesion to the left frontal lobe. So the theory of Broca's area, the anterior speech region, and Broca's aphasia symptoms that result from damage to that area. And the Wernicke investigated region of the cortex that receives information from the ear behind Broca's area. His patient spoke fluently but with no sense, could hear but could not understand what was said to them. So now you have Wernicke's area on the region of the temporal lobe and the aphasia that results from the damage to that area. And the Wernicke's area connected with sound and speech, also possibly controlling uh, the mouth muscles. So pretty, you know, this stuff's getting more complicated very quickly. Stuff's getting pretty complicated pretty quickly, but you know, let's keep at it because uh, this is important stuff, and you know, this is going to set the basis for being able to understand this more and better. So let's do another, you know, quick review of these different topics. So bringing the psyche into focus, a historical overview and introduction, some more psychological, philosophical backdrop, historical backdrop uh, to this idea of what is the psyche in these interrelating, overlapping subjects. So you have John Locke, essay concerning human understanding, presents a new idea about human nature and the self, which becomes the basis for all thinking about the self and mind during the 18th century. Thesis all is based on the working of the senses to the Aristotelian psyche, the study of the soul psyche, the study of the nature of the soul, which he considered the basis of all life. The soul is the essence of all living things that makes them behave in the way distinctive of living things. So according to Aristotle, you have three types of souls. We went over this many times, but just you know, really get this down. The vegetative, nutri uh, nutritive soul, the sensitive soul, and the intellective, rational soul. The vegetative, the lowest soul, which is included the function, basic to all living things, nutrition, growth, and reproduction. The sensitive soul, second highest of the three souls, which included all the powers of the vegetative soul, as well as the powers of movement and emotion, as well as the ten internal and external senses. And the intellective rational soul included not only the vegetative and sensitive powers, the organic facilities of the other two souls, but also the three rational powers of intellect, intellective memory, memory of concepts, as opposed to the mere sense images and will so then you have descartes mechanical philosophy the only principles which i accept or require in physics are those of geometry and pure mathematics these principles explain all natural phenomena and enable us to provide quite certain demonstrations regarding them everything in the natural world can be explained by mathematics and mechanics for descartes the totality of all possible existence in the world was composed of two kinds of substances matter extensions of dead matter you know, thinking stuff that he refers to mind or soul and the split between the human body and a dead body, you know, the, the missing mind or soul. So more John Locke, Father Liberalism, essay concerning human understanding. All is based on the working of the senses, based on the idea of Thomas Hobbes and the idea of human reasoning in Leviathan. Follows mechanical understanding of sense perceptions of his time. Hobbes first presented idea that sense perception is key to understanding human behavior. To govern humans, we need to understand their behavior. To understand the senses is therefore key. 
Leviathan is the first attempt at social engineering based on negative assumption about human nature that drove his investigation of the census. So Locke's essay deals with the possibilities and limits of human understanding. The second edition adds the chapter of identity and diversity before setting ourselves upon inquiries of that nature. It was necessary to examine our abilities to see what objects our understandings were and were not fitted to deal with. His method of, is Newtonian, an empirical investigation into understanding of human reason and the understanding of human morality. Questions Aristotelian, to Aristotelian reasoning, which is still around at his time, syllogism, deductive, deductive in the Cartesian I, innate ideas, and particularly the innate idea of the I. So Locke's central claim, mind is a blank state at birth, thus any person's character his or herself is not innate but made throughout life due to ongoing sense perception. Mind is in a constant development. The blank slate is thus slowly filled. Questions with many earlier beliefs. Immaterial innate soul that by its very nature maintains unity both at a time and over time and is naturally immortal. This idea rests on a metaphysical a priori rather than empirical investigation. Cartesian idea that humans are machines and made conscious somehow through God's immortal soul, that this is the static idea of a soul which allows no development over time. So Locke breaks all of these ideas, breaks with all of these ideas, but retains the idea of immaterial soul and the self-reflective mind from Descartes. So a serious problem arises, how can a human being have the impression to be whole over the same time if all the human self is derives from the ongoing imprint of external sense impression? So introduces the term consciousness defined as any sort of reflective knowledge. It is impossible for anyone to perceive without perceiving that he is not perceived, which makes everyone to be what he calls self and thereby distinguishes himself from all other thinking beings. And this alone consists personal identity. Lack solution to the problem. He defines selfhood or the self as a combination of consciousness defined as reflexive reasoning and memory that ensures its unbroken continuity. Unity of the self is morally important to Locke because human terrestrial knowledge is necessary and necessarily imperfect and being aware of the fact we always need to exercise moral judgment on other people's state of consciousness. So have sensationalism, a form of empirical epistemology that limits experiences as a source of knowledge to a sensation or sense perception. It imagines the mind is a tabula rasa only to be filled subsequently by ideas through sense perception. Of course, these ideas do not come from nothing, but rely on earlier models. You have Aristotelian psychology, the study of the soul psyche, the study of the nature of the soul, which he considers the basis of all life. The soul is the essence of all living things that makes them behave in a way distinctive of living things. So you have David Hume, further critique, stable and coherent self, could have its origin solely in sensation and reflection. Hume shares Locke's sensationalist epistemology, far from being unitary, unitary creatures who are every moment initially conscious of what we call ourselves. We are instead nothing but a bundle of collection of different perceptions, which succeed each other with an inconceivable rapidity and are in flux and movement. The claim the self is a fiction or an artifice and a construction of the most unreliable of human mental fa uh, faculties the imagination next to memory and reason. So after this, we have Eitan Benet de Candelac in the Treatise on Sensation, 1974, following Locke in France. Questions Locke's idea that sense gives its intuitive knowledge of objects. Consequence, we need to study each sense and have to train them claim all, all human faculties and knowledge are transferred sensation, exclude the idea of brain reflection from Locke, example of this statue that is awakened by one sense after another. So you have mesmer, mesmerism, a theory which assumed a natural energetic transference that occurred between all animated and inanimate objects, the so-called animal magnetism. His theory attracted a widespread following between 1780 and 1850 all over Europe, hence the pop popular the term mesmerism till today. So we had this machine, a vessel about a foot and a half high, which is called the bu bu bouquet, is so large that 20 people could easily sit around it near the edge of the lid, which it covers. Okay, people look into Mesmer's machine and that uh, he used to conduct these experiments on looking on energy 
nice picture of that. So the claim mesmerism did pose a problem for the scientific committee, not by departing from the science of his time, nor by violating the rules, but by too literally applying its credo, the credo of sensation and sensibility. Mesmer was a kind of character of natural science in the sentimental empiricist idiom. So at the time, um, mesmerism seemed scientific with what was known at the time. Sensationalism is extremely successful and is spreading through wider culture. Diaries, memoirs, novel reading spreads idea of sensationalism and feeling as a response to the drama of the subjective. Sensationalism shaped the entire 18th century culture, culture of sensibility. Locke is applied to other subje subjects, literature, morals, emotions. You did a row on sensibility in 1780, a vivid effect on our souls of an infin infinite infinity of delicate observations, sediment and emotional movement in the body. In response to physical sensation, sensibility is the first germ of thought deriving directly from nature, but by the middle of the 18th century is a physical sensation and a moral sentiment. Distinction in chronology gets lost. So the further research into the mind-body problem, anatomic and physiological research into nerves and fascination with all kinds of mystical fluids, including, including the newly discovered fluid of electricity. So good stuff here. Check the chat. Got a minion, Brundlefly. Beck wants to talk politics. I did watch Putin's. Uh, he seemed more more. I don't know. No no comment on that right now. Maybe a different time we'll comment. But I, I did watch Putin and uh, President Trump's. Uh, you um show or, or <laughs> today it was interesting so no comment on that let's uh keep it on topic and you know, maybe separate and maybe we could do a you know my my opinion on the, these matters doesn't really matter so i'm going to try to keep on studying keep on advancing knowledge in my areas of expertise so let's look at overview of clinical neuropsychology it's from bonn germany from a conference there in 2013 just to, you know, to look over who are the type of people that study this area and the divisions of it that we're, we're going to go over many times. And if you, you know, you're connected to a local university, you know which departments are studying these topics. So the definition of neuropsychology, the domains, working fields, benefits, side effects for patients and for teams. So just the definition, neuropsychology addresses the structure and function of the brain as they relate to psychological processes and behavior, functional change, deficits in cognition, emotional, psychological symptoms or consequences, consequences on behavior, activities, and participation. Nice little diagram. Definition, according, I, I guess, the International Conference person is considered healthy if his or her bodily and mental structures and functions are intact according to statistical norms, is able to perform all kinds of activities as a person without a health problem would, is able to fulfill social roles and partake in society as a person without a health problem would, participation. So the working fields of neuropsychology, this in Germany, assessment and therapy and clinical diagnostic and treatment settings, acute clinics and early rehabilitation, stationary rehabilitation, ambulatory rehabilitation, and the actual neuropsychology practice, diagnostics, and assessments to verify claims against insurances, pension, forensic questions, rehabilitation in the workplace, case management, university, and research settings. So topics, functional status, attention, memory, visual spatial function, visual field and neglect, executive functions, awareness of symptoms, psychological status, the consequences of functional deficits in everyday life, you know, the basic activities of daily living, mobility, work, social roles, relationship, and family, and the therapy for trying to correct people who might have problems in this field using the, you know, the brain understanding of neuropsychology, your functional training, adaption and consequences, coping with consequences of illness, Support of rehabilitation in the workplace, support of finding alternative 
work settings if return to former one is not possible. Support in finding activities and life content if work is not possible at all. So the essential views on so neuropsychology therapy is a, a clear distinction between cognitive therapy and psychotherapy therapy is impossible. Changes in one field always lead to changes in the other. Coping with neuropsychological deficits always challenges former ideas on how life is. Diagnostics are part of the therapy process. So neuropsychology is what do they do for patient? Assessment of function and explanation about the meaning of the results for the life of the person can help clarify unknown, strange, irritating sensations and experiences. Development of a therapeutic strategy that comprises functional improvements as well as aspects of dealing with the symptoms and coping can help patients to regain a sense of control. Actual improvements in functional status can lead to improvements in activities of everyday life and ideally lead to healing. Reinstatement of former ways of living, neuropsychologists can take a useful role as translator or counselor for patients in relating to partner, uh, partners, families, and if return to work is an option towards employees and colleagues. Neuropsychological diagnostics can give clear recommendations for otherwise unclear questions, like can you drive or not, can you work or not, can you look after your own uh, personal needs. Psychotherapeutic interventions can enhance coping and dealing with the illness. So side effects and limitations, not every accessible symptom is treatable. Improvements might not go as far enough to fulfill the goals a patient has. Relatively extensive diagnostic options are not matched with clear-cut strategies for treatment. Diagnostic results can lead to restrictions and negative consequences. Frequently, neuropsychological diagnostic and therapy is prescribed by doctors and not something a patient voluntarily seeks after, leading to the fact that the neuropsychological has the role of control agent more than the role of a therapist. The confrontation with deficits can lead to frustration, anxiety, and depression. It's an example. So you use that for planning. You could use neuropsychology for planning and rehabilitation. Help explain problems experienced in other therapies. Attention deficits might be interpreted as insufficient motivation. Visual spatial deficits might lead to the impression of inappropriate contact behavior. Lack of awareness of drive might seem as motivational problems. So they could take the role as a contact person for partners or relatives of the patient and could make contact with employers in order to plan in advance return to work or case management. Further side effects, different occupational backgrounds lead to different views and interpretations about symptoms and the way to treat them, different languages and codes. Neurorehabilitation, there are wide overlaps of possible responsibilities. Neuropsychologists, occupation therapists, neuropsychologists, doctors. This can lead to a lack of clarity about who is responsible for what. There's a hierarchical difference between occupations. So in uh, Germany, the doctor is over the neuropsychologist who is over other therapeutic uh, occupations, ways to deal with the problem in interdis interdisciplinary team settings, clarity about the hierarchical structures, clarity about individual fields of responsibility, define ways to deal with conflict, well-defined processes of team meetings, clear definition of goals of rehabilitation and the therapist of oc or occupation that is mainly responsible. Therapy goals should be described as concrete and practical as possible, evaluation of goal attainment on a regular basis. Different views of patient problems and needs and resulting ideas for treatment are the most important strengths of interdisciplinary teams, further advantage of diversity. Okay, glad to go over this stuff and uh, you know, create the framework to understand this better. And you know, I'm just gonna keep on pounding away. And uh, so let's look at another one of memory. We'll start getting a little bit into the brain. And uh, Learning and memory. And this this is a you know, graduate level course, so we're hitting different levels from high school, college to graduate, and we're going to be looking at some of the top research papers on the field, the most uh, technical scientific stuff out there also. So learning, habituation, Pavlonian learning, instrumental learning, biological mechanisms, higher order cognition, declarative versus non-declarative memory, spatial learning, clinical cases. Learning is process by which experiences change our nervous system and behavior. Habituation, decrement in reflex responses due to repeated stimulus 
presentation. So you see the example of a synapse process from the air to the eye to a blink or auditory where the same sound could cause someone to blink. Pavlonian learning, classical condition, you have unconditioned stimulus, unconditional response, conditioned stimulus and conditioned response. So maybe we'll get more into Pavlonian training, you know, behavioralism. That's still very applicable today, especially for materialist. Instrumental learning, a learning procedure whereby the effects of a particular behavior in a particular situation increase, reinforce, or decrease, punish the probability of the behavior, also called operant conditioning. So reinforcing stimulus, appetitive stimulus that follows a particular behavior and thus makes the behavior become more frequent. You know, punishing stimulus, adverse stimulus that follows a particular behavior and thus makes the behavior become less frequent. In biological mechanisms, you have long-term potential, potentiation, long-term increases in the excitability of a neuron caused by repeated high-frequency activity of input, associated long-term potentiation, the long-term potentiation in which concurrent stimulation of weak and strong synapses to a given neuron strengthens the weak ones. Examples in the ear, where you have a strong and weak stimulus put in at the same time, and the evidence will show that the weak connections are strengthened through connection to working with a strong one. You're, so we're, you know, if we continue with this, we're going to get in quite a bit of detail about neurons and brain structure. So we're starting with some pretty basic biology. And uh, it's going to get pretty complicated and it's, you know, be like uh, biochemistry at the end of this. And most of the modern research papers um, are actually quite biochemical. And in real science, it would probably have to be reduced to um, physics. So NMDA receptor, specialized inotropic glutamate receptor that controls a calcium channel that is normally blocked by magnesium ions in the AMPA receptor ionotropic glutamate receptor that controls a sodium channel when it's open and produces EPSPs. So you have further of these, you know, brain processes, you know, saying this is going to get pretty complicated pretty quickly and you're going to need a background in chemistry, biochemistry to really understand what's happening on this level of uh, sense perception and you know, what the brain really does. So the medial forebrain bundle, fiber bundle that runs through the lateral hypothalamus. Electrical stimulation of the media forebrain bundle is reinforcing. They have the ventral uh, tegmental area, dopa uh, minergic neurons and midbrain whose axons form the mesolimbic and mesocortical system plays a role in reinforcement. And the nucleus acumens, nucleus of the forebrain that receives dopamine secreting terminal buttons from neurons of the ventral tegmental area involved in reinforcement. So, you know, these biological mechanisms are re reality to really understand what we're going to be talking about. This is going to be the most important thing, but I'm going to give you the philosophical uh, underpinnings and, and try to explain it um, without the complicated biochemistry, but we're also going to cover parts of that, and that might not be applicable to uh, you know, to this stream or, or possibly or maybe all of a special stream that deals more with these uh, complicated uh, matters of biochemistry, biophysics. So then high order cognition, we have declarative and non-declarative memory, spatial learning, clinical cases, declarative memory, memory that can be verbally expressed, such as memory for events in a person's past, and non-declarative memory, memory whose formation does not depend on the hippocampal formation, a collective term for perception, perceptual stimulus response and motor memory, Episodic memories, memories of collection of perceptions of events organized in a time and identified by a particular context. Somatic memories, a memory of facts in general information. And you know, here the part of the brain involved in that. You know, so by the time we're done with this, we're going to be an expert in the brain.
and the, you know, the tests on cognition are going to largely focus on measuring different activity in different parts of the brain in relating it to uh, thought and cognition, although I call it indirect, and, and you know, so we'll have to see you know, famous uh, you know, incomplete picture test. Over a period of time, people you know, completed the picture. So then cognition, like the brain, will fill in missing details automatically. Uh, the mirror tracing test, over time, the ability to uh, trace from a mirror. Spatial learning, the test on rats. Spatial memories, functional imaging. Studies have shown that the right hippocampal formation becomes active when a purpose person is remembering or performing a navigational task. Play cell and neuron that becomes active when an animal is in a particular location of the environment, most typically found in the hippocampal formation. And the clinical cases of uh, anomalies. You So we have consolidation, process by which short-term memories are converted into long-term memory, short-term memory, immediate memory for events which may or may not be consolidated into long-term memory, long-term memory, relative stable memory of events that occurred in the more distant past. Retrograde amnesia, cannot remember events prior to brain damage. Antrograde amnesia, cannot remember events that occur after brain damage. Korsakoff syndrome, permanent antrograde ant ant amnesia caused by brain damage resulting from chronic alcoholism. Confabulation, the reporting of memories or events that do not take place without the intention to deceive seen in people with Korsakoff syndrome. You have uh, Alpizer brain. Okay, so good stuff here. You know, glad to be pounding through. I'm glad people are watching. Thanks, uh, Etchy and Penelope, Mr. Burke, Big Cat. Appreciate people coming in here. And, uh, you know, I, I want to really advance scholarship. And uh, so let's keep this going. So then in, I'm going to be interspersing here for you know, my future esotericism, trying to correlate these ancient philosophies, philosophers, religion, esotericism, uh, different religion approaches to these questions. And uh, we're going to be looking at how these ideas progressed over time. So I'm going to be interspersing different things like the history of science and, and just to keep on building and, and give people a frame to how to plug these ideas in. And the, you know, people who study other parts about history, politics, economics, religion, you know, keep on placing these events, you know, seeing what's happening at the same time and it's going to be important. And, you know, if we do move on to Freemasonry and these like greater forces pushing through history, it's going to be important to have the working vision of how all these different uh, progressions throughout history. So intellectual history of concept, history of ideas, history of concepts, text and context, global intellectual history. So I love the history of science and technology. I'm a civil engineer. I like knowing how things are made and, the, you know, like the new gadgets and uh, you know, how these new thought ideas are related to ideas. So just toss in a few slides on this here and there. You know, the Kuhn cycle we mentioned. Normal science, modal drift, modal crisis, modal revolution, paradigm change. Political context of ideas, the problem of generating protecting knowledge is a problem of politics. And conversely, the problem of political order always involves solutions to the problem of knowledge. So you know, what counts as science and technology? You have inventions, knowledge. Science, natural, medical, cosmological, theological, political, ideas, edges blurred with cultural history, literature, art, architecture, cartography, infrastructure, agricultural techniques, crafts, military, labor, financial, knowledge. You got a lot of you know, famous shipbuilding history, caravan technology in the history, you know, camels, bread for transport in the Middle East. Yeah, the churches, the building of the Gothic churches and the arches and the buttresses and architecture, the Islamic scientists. A lot of people um, haven't studied the uh, 
you know, modern intellectualism, the debt of gratitude we owe to the Islamic uh, golden age. And a lot of these ideas actually, uh, you know, the Greek wisdom was largely conveyed to Europe through Arabic. And uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, other concepts that have permeated our ideas of Western thought that are in fact what Islamic in origin. So how do ideas travel? How do they influence each other? You just things to think about. So if circulation serves as a strong counterpoint to the unidirectionality of diffusion or even a dissemination or transmission of binaries such as metropolitan science, colonial science, or center periphery, which all imply a producer and an end user, circulation suggests a more open flow and especially the possibility of the mutations and reconfigurations coming back to the point of origin. Moreover, the circulatory perspective confers agency and all involved in the interactive Moreover, the circulatory perspective confers agency and all involved in the interactive process of knowledge and construction. So, I mean, it's very complicated trying to understand how knowledge progresses, how we build off each other. Chinese science, magnetic compass, gunpowder, paper, printing, clock, porcelain, stirrup, cast iron, all things that came to the West from China. You know, the huge book by Needham on science and civilization in China. Seven volumes. Jesuit uh, travels to China, Islamic golden age, mathematics, physics, philosophy, architecture, the water mill. Bayat al-Hikmah, the Baghdad House of Wisdom that was the center of the Islamic Golden Age. And here's a chart trying to show kind of the divergence of uh, Europe splitting ahead to uh, be the center of science, you know, starting around 200, 250 years ago or, or even less, 150 years ago, where, you know, other cultures, maybe like India, J India, China, Spain, you know, to where you had uh, Britain, France, Germany, so Italy really jumping off and, uh, you know, pushing the science forward. And, you know, science leading to benefits, life expectancy, nutrition, risk-taking, geographic advantage, path dependency, labor costs, science and technology, religion, values, political and state, war, demographics. So here also there's... The second paradigm we'll talk about entangled knowledge. 14th to 18th century was a period of travel and discovery, which represented a crucial moment in which a global imagination and nascent modernity emerged, not as the continued unfolding of, of privileged European trajectory spreading out in ever widening concentric circles from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic and thence to the Indian Ocean to the rest of the world, but as a more or less global shift with many different sources and roots, and inevitably many different forms and meanings depending on which society we look at it from so just a quick uh, inner you know thought about knowledge increasing or you know over time global circulation of knowledge and you know, put put these larger picture together in, in our thought of consciousness so keep it going check the chat Yep, thank you for Penelope. So let's keep it going. Let me, sorry, just check my Facebook and email. Okay, so I got a lot of uh, stuff here. So to try to get through as much as possible. As I said, I'm probably going to be at this for a good few weeks even because there's so much material that... Uh, I might do like five, ten of these, especially you know people keep on turning tuning in for this. So let's look here quickly also the history of optics because you know especially when we talk about consciousness and sense perception, um, you know that one of these huge things is how do we study and measure and, and have empiricism of the external world, and we're going to talk a lot about eyesight. Eyesight probably being the main most complicated sense of the different forms of sense perception and uh, of what we think is consciousness. So when we, you know, our internal vision 
like our internal frame of consciousness is in reality a picture of the external world and how our brain forms that picture of the external world will be a theme throughout any study of consciousness and you know hence the importance of understanding vision and the you know so that's a quick overview of the history of optics so you have Demac uh uh democritus developer of the concept of the atoms attempted to explain perception and color then aristotle question and perception rejected the euclidean theory that vision was solely due to rays emanating from the eyes and touching the objects euclid in his optica noted that light travels in straight lines and described laws of reflection belief that vision involves rays going from the eyes to the object seen you know, archimedes sets up optical weapons defense machines for the king of uh Syracuse, now Sicily, to defend the city against the Romans, very much involves uh, catoptrics, reflection on surfaces. You know, Seneca wrote about magnifying effects on liquid and transparent vessels. To hero of Alexandria, light follows the shortest path, law of, ref of refraction. Ptolemy wrote a five-volume textbook in optics, observed the small angle approximations of Snell's law. The ratio of the angles of incidence versus the angle of refracted light is constant. And uh, you know, back to the Muslim Islamic Golden Age, the Al Azan and uh, the Al Haytham investigated reflections from spherical and parabolic mirrors, disproved Ptolemy's refraction law, disagreed with Euclidean theory of vision, discussed atmospheric refraction, explained the increase in apparent size of the sun and moon near the horizon, attempted to measure the height of the atmosphere. Sir Robert Gro Groset, uh, Grosseteste, the Oxford, 12. 20 theories should be combined with experimental observation as basic scientific method believe that colors are related to light intensity shared view of the earlier greeks that vision involves emanations from the eye roger bacon 1250 insisted on experimental observations as basic scientific method carried out experiments with lenses, lenses and mirrors described principles of reflection and refraction uh, finite speed of light he attributed rainbow to sunlight reflection by raindrops in uh, Vitello of Sicily, 1270, completed Perspectiva, which was standard text on optics for several centuries, parabolic mirrors, construction, uh, refraction, angle of refraction, non-proportional to angle of incidence. Galileo, 1600, learned in 1909 the inter invention of the telescope by a Dutch eyeglass manufacturer, Hans Lippershey. Uh, built his own device with magnification up to 30 times, the most powerful instrument of his time, thus enabled the discoveries that established the Copernican system. And then Kepler, among the first few to accept the Copernican heliocentric astronomy, discovered the laws of planetary motion, provided correct explanation of vision and functions of the pupil, corona, and retina, gave first correct explanation of how eyeglasses work, changed the setup of Galileo's telescope by concave lenses. And Schnell, 1621 found experimentally the law of refraction and you have Descartes described Snell's law for the first time involving sinus terms the Fermi 1657 partially the principle of shortest propagation times deduction of the refraction law from Fermi's principle in uh, Francesco Mary Grimaldi 1665 described diffraction of light 65 also Robert Hooke investigated inference effects at thin films his ideas triggered the wave theory of light isaac newton investigated dispersion prisms and the spectrum of white light developed the particle theory of light worked on the correction of lens errors but did not believe in the possibility of archimates developed mirror telescopes and who and hygens in 1678 developed the wave theory of light introduced the concept of elementary waves applied the theory to explain the lower speed of light in dense medium refraction and uh, by refringence he also observed polarization in birefringent crystals Romer, 1676 proposed an experiment by astronomical observation of total eclipse of the sun and the jupiter satellite eclipses to prove and determine the finite speed of light 1670 after the invention of the microscope in 1595 by uh you low and hook improved the concepts and developed powerful devices magnification up to 300 times more hall 1730 developed an achromatic lens by trying different combinations of flint and crown glass 
Dollar copied and patented Hall's concept to start commercial production. In Gauss in the 1800, Carl Friedrich Gauss directed an astron astronomical observatory, developed a mathematical description of lenses, provided the mathematical basis for optical imaging theory, made contributions to the theory of electromagnetism. And Thomas Young supported the wave theory of light and postulated the interference principle. Two light fields show constructive or destructive interference when coherently superimposed, introduced the idea of light as a transversal wave. 1815, Frenzel supported the wave theory of light, explained the straight propagation of light in homogeneous isotrophic media, calculated diffraction patterns at apertures, deduced equations for the amplitudes of reflection and refraction, the Frenzel equations. In the Fraunhofer, developed telescopes, invented the spectroscope, investigated diffraction at optical grantings, and detected absorption lines in the solar spectrum. The Fraunhofer line still used today. Kirchhoff, 1845, developed the Kirchhoff radiation law and contributed to spectroscopy. And Faraday demonstrated the rotation of the polarization of light in a medium manipulated by a magnetic field. And the Foucault and Fizet measured the speed of light for the first time in an earthbound experiment. And then in 1864, James Clerk Maxwell developed the electromagnetic classic wave theory of light, deduced the transversal character of light and the speed of light. So Michelson, 1881, determined experimentally the speed of light with large accuracy, invented the Michelson interferometer, disproved the existence of an ether, a medium which was supposed to work as a carrier for light. Light travels through a vacuum without the need of a carrier medium. And the Abbe, 1887, developed the theory of optical images in a microscope designed for production of optical instruments based on scientific theory rather than try and error investigated lens errors. Heinrich Hertz designed a detector and oscillator for electromagnetic waves to demonstrate reflection and refraction in the laboratory. Electromagnetic wave properties are the same as those of light. Light is an electromagnetic wave. Hertz also discovered the photoelectric effect. In Max Planck, 1900, quantum theory of light, beginning of quantum optics, Planck's body, black body radiation law, deduction of the values for Planck's constant H, the Boltzmann constant K, Avogadro's number, and the charge of the electron, you know, Einstein, explained the photoelectric effect, introduced the concept of light quanta called photons, later called photons, postulated a constant speed of light, special theory of relativity, contributed to the quantum theory of light and matter. In 1912, Maxman Liu discovered the fraction of X-rays at crystals, conducted optical experiments to support Einstein's special theory of relativity. In De Bruegel, 1924, postulated the existence of matter waves, defining the beginning of matter wave optics. The wave character of matter was demonstrated by Davidson and Germer in 26, observing the interference of an electron beam on a nickel crystal. Johnson demonstrating the interference of an electron beam in a double slit experiments. And then Nolan Ruska in 31 built the first transmission electron microscopy based on the concept of matter waves and electron optics implemented with electrostatic and magnetic lenses. 1957, Gordon Gould patented the optical pumped laser based on the concept of light amplification. And till today, the invention of the laser pushed the huge amount of research and developments in modern applied optics and optical technology. So pretty fascinating stuff, nice backdrop on the history of science. If Penelope, you're referring to the Kabbalist breakdown of the 613 mitzvahs into the 365 uh, positive and 248 negative commandments. But, uh, you know, good stuff. I'm going to keep this going. So... Let's look at uh, one last slide show. So we're going to see that uh, you know, sense perception is extremely important uh, to understanding consciousness. And uh, it's really complicated how these senses work and how these things work. So we're going to keep on covering this from many, many different angles and try to really get this and really understand this. Okay, attention and consciousness.
So, you know, part of consciousness is going to be attention, which is related to sense perception and the control of sense perception. So here, William James, 1890, Principles of Psychology. Millions of items are present to my senses which never properly enter into my experience. Why? Because they have no interest for me. My experience is what I agree to and attend to. Each of us literally chooses by his ways of attending to things what sort of universe he shall appear to himself to inhabit. So, you know, hence sense perception modulated by attention attention systems the connection between sense perception and attention paying attention to our sense perceptions like consciously controlling the senses as opposed to the unconscious uh, senses so attention's goal to truthful perception of the world is neither required nor necessarily attempted conscious experiences focus on gathering information quickly details are filled in to give senses of continuity to our perception this is the point of attention in general to concentrate on what is important distinction between attention and consciousness common sense distinction between attention and consciousness we can ask someone to please pay attention but not to please be conscious in general however when people pay attention to something they generally become conscious of it the common sense distinction between attention and consciousness suggests that there are attentional control mechanisms that often determine what or will not become conscious so you have selective attention the real world voluntary and automatic attention are generally mixed for example we can train ourselves to pay attention to the new ringtone we found in our cell phone when it rings and we suddenly pay attention to it is that voluntary or automatic so back to william james consciousness is constantly moving stream of thoughts feelings and emotion consciousness can be viewed as our subjective awareness of mental events it includes monitoring mental events control consciousness allows us to formulate and reach goals consciousness may have evolved to direct or control behavior in adaptive ways and we've discussed before leave its half second delay electrically stimulated patients uh, somo somatosensory cortices during surgery minimal level of stimula stimulation necessary at this intensity half a second of continuous stimulation before any perception shorter stimulation requires greater intensity so what happens during this lag Reaction time can be 200 milliseconds. Recognition could be three to 400 milliseconds, but Lieben's delay is half a second. So our body responds before we are conscious of why it is responding. Subjective referral after neuronal adequacy is reached, the event is referred back to the point at which it occurred. So the cortex and consciousness, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is activated during conscious control task. Subjects asked to name the ink color in the Stroop task below have difficulty when the word name and color are different the color naming task was associated with active activation of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex you know, so you expect when you see green or you see the wrong color in the with the wrong uh, with the word and the brain activity associated with that the tension our consciousness awareness is limited in capacity and we are aware of only a small amount of the stimuli around us at any one time attention refers to the process by which we focus our awareness three functions of attentional processes orienting function towards the environment control the content of consciousness thinking about one thing but not the other and maintaining alertness the brain's the base of the conscious experience binding features into conscious Objects, the concept of feature binding, combining color, location, shape, and the like into a single neuronal assembly is often necessary for visual consciousness. Treesman suggested that the attentional spotlight was required to combine different aspects of stimulus into a reportable event. So all the different senses working together to form this one picture we have in our head. You know, we're looking at how does consciousness arise from the senses. If it's a brain function, then we'll be looking how would we study that as a brain function. But even for those of us who believe in the soul, um, just how do all these senses um, get combined together to have one single sense of consciousness? How do you make a whole lot of the parts? So what is divided attention refers to a task in which a person is asked to attend to two tasks at the same time. Subject may be asked to listen to one conversation um you know different between the right and left ear some information on the other channel being processed there's been studies on this 
you know, different messages coming in at different uh, times and different ears. You have attention to the brain. You have uh, Michael Posner, two attention systems, two functions, interior frontal lobe, task requiring awareness, planning and writing, and the posterior parietal lobe, task involving visual spatial abilities, and reticular activating system for arousal. So daydreams are shifts in attention towards internal thoughts and imagined scenarios. College students may spend as much as 50% of their waking time in a daydream. Peeper studies of high school students have noted the predominance of negative thoughts when students are with their families as opposed to others. So psychodynamic view of consciousness. Freud argued that three mental systems form consciousness. You have the conscious mental events that you are aware of, the preconscious mental events that can be brought into awareness, and the unconscious Mental events that are inaccessible to awareness, events are actively kept out of awareness. The uh, studies on subliminal perception. Unconscious cognitive processes. Information processing view can be extended to analysis of unconscious processes. Notion is that many brain mechanisms operate in parallel. Some of these mechanisms operate outside of the level of consciousness. Functional significance of a conscious mechanisms are efficient and rapid, can operate simultaneously, operate in the absence of consciousness. The brain base of the conscious experience, unconscious comparison. How can we investigate conscious experience? Consciousness has been used as a variable with experiments designed to compare conscious and unconscious conditions in the same stimuli, in the same experiment using the same stimuli. Backwards masking is used to compare conscious and unconscious perception. Subjects do not perceive the smiling face, but the unconscious face still primed to behavior and brain activity. Blind sight. People of damage to the central portion of the occipital cortex are blind in the sense that they are unable to see objects placed before them, are able to provide partial information about the geometric shape of an object. Blind sight may involve a primitive visual system in the midbrain. So what's the neurology? Consciousness is distributed through the brain. Hindbrain and midbrain are important for arousal and for sleep. Damage to the reticular formation can lead to a coma. Prefrontal cortex is a key for conscious control of information processing. So sleep and dream dreaming, behavior characteristics of sleep, minimal movement, stereotype prone posture, require a high degree of stimulation to arousal organism. Physiological characters of sleep, brainwake activity, EG, Paralysis of muscle, EMG, cardiovascular changes, alternative, alternating cycles of arousal. And, you know, the variation between species, how much they sleep. The opossum that sleeps over 18 hours in the day to, like, horse that only sleep two hours a day. Functions of sleep, memory consolidation, energy conservation, preservation from predators, restoring bodily function. Sleep deprivation can alter immune functions and lead to early death. Sleep deprivation can also lead to hallucinations and perceptual disorder. And you know, the sleep cycle, the REM, we discussed this uh, in previous uh, slides. Characteristics, characteristics of REM sleep, presence of rapid eye movement, presence of dreaming, increased autonomic nervous system activity, e.g. resemblance that of awake state, beta wave, motor paralysis, except for the diaphragm. Your dreaming, psychoanalytical view, dreams represent a window into the unconscious, the latent content meaning can be inferred from the manifest content of the actual dream. In the cognitive view, dreams are constructed from the daily issues of the dreamer. In the biographical view, Dreams represent the attempt of the cortex to interpret the random neural firings of the brain during sleep. You have altered states of consciousness, you have meditation, hypnosis, drug ingestion, religious experiences. Uh, so studies on the brain and consciousness. There are many sources of evidence suggesting that the more we are conscious of some event from visual perception to the motor control, the more cortical activity we are likely to find. Results of fMRI experiment brain activation during a sensomotor task where subjects were asked to tap along with the sound of a metronome. Once trained to the task, the scientists varied the pace of the metronome by 3, 7, or 20 percent. Cortical activity increased dramatically as a function of the unpredictability of the tapping task. Fast cortical interactions may be needed for conscious events. It is believed that rhythmic synchrony between different brain regions may signal cooperative and competitive interactions between neuronal populations 
needed to perform tasks, particularly those that are conscious under voluntary control, like we discussed yesterday in the paper on the osculatory motor um, in wave frequencies of the brain. So the summary, some hypothesis, selective attention to visual stimulus seems to be guided by parts of the frontal and parietal lobes. Conscious cognition can be shown to recruit frontal parietal regions. Those selective attention can be thought of as an act of focusing brain resources on visual cortex, particularly the region where feature analysis and construction seem to be take place. Conscious cognition can be seen as going in the opposite direction, a visual object serving to mobilize cortical regions far beyond visual, co visual cortex alone. Okay, Tom, welcome, esoteric, a full uh, over a minion. So I'm glad, glad you're here. So what, do I, what else do I got? So let's do a little reading. I got more slides, but I want to get some of these uh, things off my off my desktop. So let me do a little reading. You know, to keep on going on trying to solve, understand consciousness, and you know. So let's get into uh, you know some scientific papers. This one from 2014, structural qualia solution to the hard problem of consciousness. The hard problem of consciousness has often been claimed to be unsolvable by the methods of traditional empirical sciences. It has been argued that all, that all the objects of empirical sciences can be fully analyzed in structural terms, but that a consciousness is or has something over and above its structure. However, modern neuroscience has introduced a theoretical framework in which also the apparent non-structural aspects of consciousness, namely the so-called quality qualia or qualitative properties, can be analyzed in structural terms. That framework allows us to see qualia as something compositional with internal structures that fulfill, fully determine their qualitative nature. Moreover, these internal structures can be identified with certain neural patterns. Thus, consciousness as a whole can be seen as a complex neural pattern that misperceives some of its own highly complex structural properties as monadic and qualitative. Such neural patterns is analyzable in fully structural terms, and thereby the hard problem is solved. introduction, the hard problem is a tension between three theses. One possible way to present the hard problem of consciousness is to consider three similar possible theses that are in an interesting tension. First, all the objects of physics and other natural sciences can be fully analyzed in terms of structures and relations or simply in structural terms. Second, consciousness is or has something over and above its structure and relations. Third, the existence of nature and consciousness can be fully explained in terms of natural sciences. Should the second thesis be incorrect and consciousness fully analyzable in structural terms, then finding the structure of consciousness in some patterns of neural activity or perhaps in some linguistics behavioral pattern and studying the origin and nature of that structure would hopefully reveal us eventually all there is to know about consciousness. On the other hand, if both the first and second theses are true. It follows directly that consciousness cannot be an object of physics and other natural or behavioral sciences, and has, hence its existence cannot be explained by these sciences. David Chalmers, the author of The Hard Problem of Consciousness, accepts both of the first and the second theses and draws also the conclusions mentioned above. He adds, adds the premise that uh, what cannot be physically explained is not itself physical, Therefore, he is convinced that the only solution to the hard problem is to endorse some sort of ontological dualism, most preferably a form of property dualism. He argues that traditional natural sciences, for example, neuroscience and cognitive science, can perhaps one day explain all the structural relations, relational properties of consciousness, for example, in terms of neural, functional, or informational structures and relations. But the consciousness has, besides these, also phenomenal properties that are in principle out of reach of the traditional scientific methods. However, a number of philosophers have argued that all forms of ontological dualism are philosophically highly pro problematic, and basically everyone agrees that it would be desirable, if possible, to find a solution to the hard problem without endorsing any form of ontological dualism. This paper will first argue that dualism can be avoided and the hard problem can be solved by accepting the first and the third thesis while rejecting the second one. In other words, this paper argues that the object of physics and other natural sciences can indeed fully analyzed in structural terms, but that so can consciousness. 
More specifically, paper suggests that the apparent non-structural monadic elements of consciousness, namely the qualia, are in fact compositional and have an internal structure. According to my proposal, which is based mainly on the work of Francis Crick and uh, Christoph Koch, the components of qualia are unconscious associations and the structure of quality are the structures and networks of these unconscious associations. You will argue that the structures can also be described in neural terms and thereby identified with certain neural patterns. Shortly, according to my view, qualia can be analyzed in full structural terms and identified with certain neural patterns. Since the formation of the hard problem, I'm using the formation according to which is the tension between the three above presented ideas is not a typical one. Perhaps a few words should be said about before proceeding. There are two main reasons for me to favor the above presented formulation. The first one is the rhetorical and the second is just strategic. The rhetorical reason is the following. The formation formulation I have chosen summarizes nicely some of the central ideas about the hardness of the hard problem, namely most presentations of the hard problem include the idea according to which all the so-called easy problems of consciousness are easy because they are problems of explaining some functions of consciousness. The hard problem is according to a problem of the existence of certain properties or aspects of consciousness which cannot be analyzed in terms of function. So Chalmers rejects physicalism on the ground that every physical phenomenon can be analyzed in terms of structures and dynamics, but that consciousness has certain properties or aspects which cannot be analyzed in terms in such terms. It has also been argued that empirical methods have X access only to dispositional properties, but that consciousness has besides those also properties that cannot be analyzed in terms of dispositions. The list of similar arguments could be continued, but is common in all of them is the idea that every object of natural science can be analyzed in terms of some structure, causal, dispositional, functional, spatial, temporal, relational, informational, but that certain properties or aspects of consciousness cannot. So I'm aware of the position according to which every object in natural science can be analyzed in terms of some specific type of structures is strictly speaking not the same one as the position according to which every object of natural science can be analyzed in structural terms. I'm also aware that the ideas described are typically used as parts of the arguments against physicalism as not as formulations of the hard problem itself. If someone wants to reject my formulation on those grounds, you're welcome to. For my purposes, it's actually enough to recognize the problem I formulated as a philosophical problem is related to the hard problem in a simple and straightforward way, which I specify below. The most common way to introduce the hard problem intuitively appealing, but rather obscure its meaning. So the hard problem is typically introduced as the problem explaining how the conscious experience rises from neural activity and why is there something it is like to be conscious. An important phase in every careful presentation of the hard problem is therefore specifying the meaning of the obscure expressions used in those intuitively appealing introductions while taking, talking about the unique and philosophical significant features of consciousness. Um, Chalmers writes, each of these conscious states has a phenomenal character while phenomenal properties or quality of characterizing what is like to be in that state. Then he specifies the meaning of quality in the following end note. On my usage, quality are simply those properties that characterize conscious states according to what is like to have them. So in this context of the hard problem, quality are, are phenomenal properties are exactly those properties or aspects of consciousness whose existence seems to be inexplicable in the framework of traditional natural sciences. Therefore, the most generally put, the essence of the hard problem is that some properties or aspects of consciousness, however we decide to call them, appear to be inexplicable in the framework of traditional sciences. Now I'm ready to state my strategic reasons for using the formulation presented above by formulating the hard problem as a tension between the three theses presented above and then approaching it by using the strategy mentioned earlier, arguing that objects of physics and other natural sciences can in be indeed fully analyzed in terms of structure and relations, but that so can consciousness. I hope to demonstrate that there are no such properties or aspects of consciousness that cannot be explained in the framework of traditional natural sciences. Therefore, for the sake of simplicity, the formulation is a legitimate formulation of the hard problem. Anyone who feels that it is in fact not can consider it as a formulation of a separate problem, which is related to the hard problem in the following straightforward way. Solving the problem I formulated by using the strategy I'm using solves also the hard problem. And this is all that should matter at the end of the day. To sum up, my strategy is based on a simple idea, a condition, which I believe to be undeniable if a phenomenon is analyzable in fully structural terms and explaining the origin 
and nature of the structure of the phenomenon amounts to explaining the origin of the nature of the phenomenon itself. I would argue that we have good reason to believe that consciousness is in fact analyzable in fully structural terms and that contemporary neuroscience can offer us a partly speculative but nevertheless plausible idea about the nature and origin of the structural phenomenon. Good stuff. Take a break to check the chat. So a nice overview of studies and evidence in the different schools people falling into. You know, informally, the main idea of scientific object structuralism is that every piece of uh, relata in whichever network of reflection studied by natural sciences can be analyzed further in relation all terms. Also, almost every element in which structures can be arguably analyzed in terms of some finer grain structure and supposing there are some fundamental elements with no finer grain internal structures it will be still arguably true that these elements are empirically accessible only via their causal relations with other elements and objects including perhaps some measuring apparatus in other words our knowledge about them is limited to relationships they have of other objects however only a relatively small minority of the proponents of scientific objective structuralism believe that structure and relations are actually all there is. You know, um, antic structural realism, also known as radical structuralism, pieces of a lot of elements of structures and theories of natural sciences are merely heuristic devices with no fundamental ontological status. Shoemaker argues a similar spirit of the casual relations and casual structures are the only thing ontologically fundamental position is sometimes referred to as causal essentialism. So many scientific object structuralists defend a less radical position known as epistemic structural realism, according to which structures and relations are simply all we can empirically access. Some proponents of epistemic structural realism argue that even though we cannot have empirical evidence for the existence of non-structural fun fundamental volata, we have to assume their existence in order to make sense of the idea of there being any relation in the first place. In other words, they argue that there could be no relation without some fundamental relata. Some philosophers defend yet a weaker form of subjective scientific object structuralism. According to them, it is true that traditional scientific methods have no access to anything but structure and relations, but that the existence of something over and above structure and relation can nevertheless be perceived, namely they hold that the existence of our immediate conscious experience is known to us directly and that we can also see that our consciousness is something over and above its structure. It is arguably something that has a structure, not something that merely is a structure. You know, such as uh, Chalmers and Russell and Seeger. So keep on reading from this paper. There's a lot to it. I'm sure you're not going to be able to read the whole thing, but uh, there's a lot of important pieces of information and understanding to move forward here. Proponents of non-structural view of consciousness have often suggested that the non-structural elements of consciousness are the, are the so-called qualia, supposed monadic and qualitative features of conscious experience. Qualia are typically considered to be private to the one experience them, ineffable by nature, the paradigmatic example of quality are simple color experience of raw feels, the redness of red or the painfulness of pain. So the typical framework behind the non-structural views about consciousness would look something like this, substantial building blocks of consciousness, namely the quality are connected by numerous complex relations and forming numerous complex structures and individual consciousness as a whole would be hence some kind of structured bundle of quality. Arguably the structure of such bundle could in principle turn out to be identical with the structure of a certain pattern of neural activity, which would be in principle accessible by methods of future neuroscience. The question of what does it exactly mean that the structure of consciousness could turn out to be a structure of neural activity pattern is obviously a tricky one. An impressive attempt to answer is made by of Renuso, who believes that the structure of consciousness will be found in the brains once we discover and learn to monitor the proper level of organization of the neural activity. 
in any other level, we will find only the neural correlates of consciousness. In other words, in those lower levels, we will find some pattern of neural activity that correlate with the content, content of our consciousness, but we would not understand why those correlations occur and what their nature is. On the proper level of organization, on the other hand, we will find a pattern that simply has a structure consciousness. The criticism, strongly the idea of there being different ontological levels in nature, um, because according to them, there are plenty of natural phenomena which do not fit nicely the framework of hierarchical organized events. Nevertheless, they're denying the obvious fact that structural patterns in nature are often organized in a semi-hierarchical manner. Still, according to the view of Chalmers and others who believe that quality are irreducibly qualitative, even if we could get from mere unexplained correlations between some neural active activity pattern and consciousness to the detailed structure identity between the two, we would still not establish full identity between them because qualia would be essentially non-structural and could not be therefore identified with any structures. For example, in the case of visual, visual consciousness, one could argue that even if we could one day see by scanning someone's brain that she has a visual experience of a red apple or on a green plate, and if we, even if we could detect all the structural details of the perceived scene, we would still arguably have no idea why the redness of the red and the greenness of the green are experienced by her in the way they are and not, for example, the other way around. The supposed privacy and ineffability of quality has made theories about them vulnerable to philosophical arguments based on the largely supportive view that the nature of language and meaning is essentially public and intersubjective. It has been argued by... Wittgenstein or uh, Quinian that the concept of a private object is philosophically highly problematic because absolute private objects could have no role in language or in any other theories. Generally, the Wittgenstein attitude towards consciousness tends to lead to an external view about the phenomenon. It seems that if all our references about the content of our consciousness are actually made by using the vocabulary of external, extramental public objects, then the proper theory of consciousness should be a theory about our linguistic behavior interactions with the extramental world. However, there seems to be a philosophically rather shallow point of view from which it makes perfect sense to claim that a mental content can be private, namely a neurobiographical point of view for which people can be seen as a biological cognitive system with limited commun communicative skills. There seems to be no deep philosophical mystery about an idea of cognitive system that is certain information about some of its inner states, but lacks the ability to communicate that information to others. So let's consider someone's conscious experience of the color red. According to Crick and Koch, the structures of such redness color experience or the meaning of the experience in a vast network of unconscious association of all the countless encounters with red objects in that person's personal history and of personal histories of her ancestors embodied in her genes. The particular phrase embodied in her genes means simply that not all the unconscious associations are formed during a person's lifetime as a result of interactions with the environment, but some of them are innate programmed by evolution. So Crick and Koch also managed to give an account of these associations to determine neural processes, According to M, there is an explicit neural representation for every aspect of our conscious experience. Uh, by an explicit neural representation, they mean an increased activity of a smallish group of neurons, most likely between 100 and 1,000 situated close together. Those groups of neurons can also be called essential nodes. Every time when the activity of one such essential nodes is above certain threshold, the person's consciousness of the corresponding aspect, it could be a color, shape, a direction of movement, a familiar object. In order to avoid various philosophical problems related to the difficult concept of neural representations, those neural events should not be seen as representations in themselves of any deeper metaphysical sense. The fact that the increased activity in certain essential nodes systematically co-occurs in proper conditions with the typical verbal reactions to certain aspects of consciousness, for example, subject reporting seeing something red, is only the prima facie reason for us to call the activity of these essential nodes explicit neural representations. One of the main reasons for such systematic co-occurrences is, according to the hypothesis, the fact that all 
the essential nodes responsible for explicit representations are directly connected to the planning modules of the brain, the prefrontal anterior cingulate cortices in particular, where the projections can easily affect the behavior of the subject. Therefore, according to the hypothesis, the tonality of all the explicit neural representations has a detailed and exact correlation with the content of the person's consciousness, since all the essential nodes responsible for the explicit neural representations are also connected to the planning modules of the brains. It means that the functioning structure of the whole network of the explicit neural representation would actually be the functional structure of the corresponding consciousness. In other words, causal effects of the network described above are supposedly identical to the causal effects of our consciousness. However, the nature of the question of the nature of the quality remains. Why should the increased activity in an essential node have a specific yet ineffable qualitative feel? According to some what speculative hypothesis of Crick and Koch, the quality associated to an explicit neural representation is the meaning of that representation to the rest of the brain in psychological and phenomenal terms. That meaning is, as mentioned before, a vast network of various unconscious associations. In neural terms, it is the network of all those neural connections that the essential node in question has with the other essential nodes. When the activity of some essential node rises above required threshold for the corresponding aspects to become part of consciousness, then the activity of most of the connected essential nodes rise slightly but stays below the required threshold. However, the slightly increased activity of the vast network of all the connected essential nodes is collectively strong enough to affect a person's attitude towards the consciously experienced aspect. Then the person becomes conscious of the corresponding aspect and its rich and specific meaning, the quality, but stays ignorant of the single unconscious association composing the meaning, the components, and structure of the quality. In order to understand the situation in phenomenal terms, it would perhaps be better to think of the so-called unconscious association not as absolute unconsciousness, but as vaguely conscious, perhaps as tip of the tongue kind of consciousness, conscious without a quality, but with an ability to recognize the missing quality instantly should it pop up the right one. So the slightly increased activity of any single essential node that corresponds to some vaguely conscious aspect would be too weak to cause any significant activity in the planning modules of the brain and thereby the subject could not report any conscious experience of the corresponding aspect. However, the slightly increased activity of the vast network of all the connected essential nodes that corresponds to the quality would be collectively strong enough to cause some neural activity in the planning modules. And so the subject could report of experience something particularly specific, but she would not be able to distinguish or recognize or report any single vaguely conscious component of that experience. Since different networks of unconscious or vaguely conscious associations would have different influences on the planning modules, the person could identify different networks of unconscious associations without having conscious access to their structures. This is why these networks would appear to her monadic and the different quality, qualitative, even though they are in fact highly complex and in principle analyzable in structural terms, since the person would have no conscious access to the complex structure of the qualia, they could not obviously communicate it to others. So the sense qualia would be truly private and inevitable to one experiencing them. By analogy, we can consider some macrophysical properties of an ordinary physical object made of wood and stone. If we examine such object at a low enough level of detail, we can call the macrophysical property of Woody and Sony qualitative properties. In order to understand the qualitative qualitative difference between wood and stone in terms of internal structure and those materials, we would have to enter some finer grain level, for example, the one in which we find the structures of single molecules. In case of consciousness, we are simply dealing with a cognitive system that is not capable of maximizing its own inner structure at the level where the qualitative properties of quality are analyzable in structural terms. Since the hypothesis presented above contains the idea according to which people are ignorant of the fundamental structure and nature of their qualia, it has some superficial resemblance to the called epistemic view of ignorance or ignorance hypothesis. To avoid confusion, it should be recognized that the main idea of the strategy of Crick and Koch are actually very different from the Ignorance hypothesis is Stoljar. The main idea of Stoljar is, in a nutshell, that we are scientifically ignorant about the nature of consciousness, and that is why we fail to see how consciousness could be reducible to anything physical or non-experiential, as Stoljar puts it. 
It is clear that the philosophical relevant ignorance in the theory of Crick and Coke is not significant ignorance, scientific ignorance, but an ignorance of individual human beings. The ignorance of individual human beings is part of their cognitive architecture, and there is no reason why we could not have scientific knowledge about the, that architecture. For example, when I have a visual perception of a red apple, I have a direct epistemic access to many structural features of my visual experience, the size and shape of the perceived apple. For instance, I do not have similar direct epistemic access to the structure, the perceived redness of my visual experience, but this does not mean that I could not be a member of a scientific community that has a scientific knowledge about that structure. Another philosophical view that has deeper and more substantive resemblance to the theory of Crick and Coke is the so-called interest perspective inaccuracy hypothesis, uh, paraboom, serious open possibility that the introspective mode of presentation misrepresents the qualitative nature of quality of phenomenal properties. Um, Paraboom 2011 also suggests the nature of that misrepresentation could be such that the qualia are actually compositional and complex but appear in introspection as primitive and monadic. If Crick and Coke are right, then qualia are indeed compositional and complex even though they appear to us primitive and monadic, therefore, if Crick and Coke are right, then the introspective inaccuracy is a fact much more than just a serious open possibility. It is an actual matter of fact. Therefore, it is interesting that Paraboom does not mention the work of Crick and Coke or any other neurobiological structure or kind of qualia. Um, one substanti substantial seemingly difference between the views of Paraboom, Crick and Coke is that Paraboom suggests that phenomenal properties might not actually have any qualitative nature, while Crick and Coke are explicit realists about quality and the qualitative nature while denying simply the quality are fundamentally qualitative. So to sum up, according to the framework introduced by Crick and Coke, quality are highly complex and perfectly public structural relational properties of some cognitive systems, even those those systems themselves perceive them as monadic and private. The blueness of blue and the redness of red are qualitatively different because the structure of networks of their composing unconscious association are different. Similar, the quality of red quails feels exactly the way it does because the structure of the network of its composing unconscious association is exactly such as it is. Of course, a skeptic would not be at all convinced. So we put it to the reader to believe that the specific quality of a quail is a result of an intense internal structure, but unless there is a way it could be somehow phenomenally verified, we have no compelling reason to believe so. Therefore, I will consider next a situation that could be, in my opinion, interpreted as having a direct glimpse into the internal structure of the apparent monadic quail. You know, Dan Daniel Dennett offers an example of a situation where an apparent monadic quail is analyzed phenomenally into several components. Dennett, famously known for denying the existence of quality of Use the above example to demonstrate how confused we are about the nature of our sensory perceptions. However, the framework of Crick and Coke allow us to interpret Denick's example as a situation in which a small part of the unconscious structure, the overtone structure of an auditory coil becomes conscious, when it is interesting that once a person has learned to recognize the individual overtone of the sound, they also understand why the ensemble of the overtones sound the way it does. In other words, most of the people would be in the situation described above, intuitively willing to admit that the overtone structure more or less determines the gu guitarist quality of the composed sound, they would still hear the original sound, but not as monadic and ineffable quail, but as the ensembles of its overtone. Also, almost everyone agree that composed sound is somehow phenomenally richer than any of the individual overtones, and that this richness can be perceived as well before as after one learns to hear overtones in the composed sound, as if we could somehow perceive that there is a lot of information in some apparently monadic quail, but could not quite tell what kind of information that is. Once we become aware of the overtone of structure, we get access to some tiny part of that information. However, it should be noticed that the above exercise will not allow us to leave the space of qualitative experience. For all the experienced individual overtones would have quality of their own, nevertheless, the exercise would allow us to see, assuming it has been fully successful, that the auditory quality, which we used to believe to be as monadic and ineffable as phenomenal redness, has actually an internal structure that more or less determines its pheno specific phenomenal character. Of course, it could be wondered if the, the mere feeling or intuition that the perceived 
guitar schnitz's composition allows us to conclude that it's actually compositional. So it goes on and on. I'll read just a tiny bit more. It's been often argued that it is ideally positively conceivable that a creature physically identical to some conscious human beings could nevertheless lack quality. In other words, they could be some sort of unconscious zombie. Similarly, it's been claimed that an ideally positive conceivable that someone physically and functionally identical to you or me could have his or her quality inverted, for example, in situations where I would experience the experience of the red quality he or she would experience the green quality and vice versa. Arguably, there would be no way of telling if a person's quality are inverted, for there would be no physical or functional signs of it. it. Seems rather obvious that if quality can be analyzed in fully structural terms, and if the structures of quality are implemented by some patterns of neural activity, then any creature that is physically identi identical to a conscious human being would also have the exact same quality Namely, it would be logically inconsistent to hold that some fully structural phenomenon could be somehow different or even absence in the equation in the occasion of where its structure presents. Therefore, you know, further argue that there is an unbridgeable epistemic gap between neural activity and quality and qualia for the existence of such a gap that is being inferred, among other things, that consciousness cannot be fully analyzed in neural terms. So according to the framework, based on the neurobiological theory of Crick and Koch, the subjective and qualitative characters of the consciousness of bats, blind persons, persons raised in black and white environments, can all be described in structural terms, even though the above character themselves would fail to do so as individuals in respect to their own consciousness. Therefore, in a sense, there truly is an epistemic gap, but it should not be thought of as a necessary gap in our scientific knowledge for it is always a gap in some particular cognitive system's individual knowledge. In some cases, we can imagine how such a gap could be bridged with the help of some hypothetical futuristic technology. For example, if we could alter in a proper way the neural structure of a blind person or a person who is raised in a black and white environment, we could in principle convey them the knowledge of what is like to see and what is like to see red. However, the case of us not knowing what is like to be a bat seems to be difficult because the cognitive structures of bats and people are simply too different. Even if we could turn a person's neur neural structure into a neural structure of a bat, we would simply have turned human consciousness that does not know what it's like to be a bat into a bat's consciousness that knows what it's like to be a bat. It seems that the idea of human consciousness that it has a structure of a bat's consciousness is simply inconsistent because the identity of human consciousness depends on having a structure of human consciousness also argued that there is a fundamental and irreducible difference between objective and subjective knowledge about consciousness. Hope that above presented ideas help also clarify the nature of that difference. Objective knowledge about some individual consciousness can be presented in structural terms and is a fact a knowledge about certain structure. In order to have such structure, one has to have access to all relevant elements of that structure. We may hope one day the entire structure of consciousness will be discovered in some patterns of neural activity, and the community of neuroscientists will then have a chance to study it. A significant work towards that goal is already made. In order to have subjective knowledge about some individual consciousness, on the other hand, one would have to be a cognitive system that has a certain structure, substructure of that individual consciousness, subjective knowledge about certain consciousness is hence always a particular substructure of that very consciousness. We may say that if objective knowledge is in some sense an abstract phenomenon, then subjective knowledge is, according to the neurobiological view adopted by this paper, always some very concrete neural structure located in someone's brain. We could, in principle, analyze and describe whichever individual instance of a certain subjective knowledge in perfectly objective and structural terms. But in order to actually have that subjective knowledge, we would have to, so to speak, turn a substrate of our own consciousness into the substructure, the structure of that knowledge. So the two concepts of knowledge, the objective and the subject, are indeed different. 
and even a perfect objective epistemic access to the structure of a certain consciousness would not guarantee us the subjective knowledge about that consciousness. However, according to the framework presented here, this is purely conceptual distinction, does not apply any metaphysical distinct, distinct, distinctions or any physically problematic epistemic distinctions. Namely, it is easy to understand and accept that having knowledge about some neural structure does not necessarily make the structure occur in one's brain. So that was great. Glad to have read through that. Very profound uh, thought. I still got nine people here. So that was long. Took me almost 30 minutes to read through that. I hope uh, you know people will gain from uh, gain from some of this uh, knowledge here. So I just <laughs> check my Facebook, my email. Just ordered another book. Just shipped. And let me see what I'm going to do next. Check the chat. So yeah, I might read another uh, so here here is the famous you know Chalmers that we mentioned David Chalmers one of the experts on the topic uh, big thinkers so let's uh, let's look at some Chalmers facing up to the problem of consciousness and I'm going to read less of this one than I read of the last one. This is the Australian National University, David Chalmers. Consciousness poses the most baffling problems in the science of the mind. There is nothing that we know more intimately in, than conscious experience, but there's nothing that is harder to explain. All sorts of mental phenomena have yielded to scientific investigation in the recent years, but consciousness has stubbornly resisted. Many have tried to explain it, but the explanations always seem to fall short of the target. Some have been led to suppose that the problem is intractable and that no good explanation can be given. It sounds familiar. That was on one of the slides I read yesterday. To make progress on the problem of consciousness, we have to confront it directly. In this paper, we we'll first isolate the truly hard part of the problem, separating it from the more tractable parts, and giving an account of why it's so difficult to explain. We'll critique recent work that uses reductive methods to address consciousness and argue that these methods are inevitably fail to come to grips with the hardest part of the problem. Once this failure is recognized, the door to further progress is open. In the second half of the paper, it will argue that if we move to a new kind of non-reductive explanation, a naturalistic account of consciousness can be given. It will put forward his own candidate for such an account, a non-reductive theory based on principles of structural coherence and organizational invariance and the double aspect view of information. So we have the easy and hard problems. So the easy problem of consciousness include explaining the following phenomenon, the ability to discriminate, categorize, and react to environmental stimuli, the integration of information by a cognitive system, the reportability of mental states, the ability of a system to access its own internal states, the focus of attention, the deliberate control of behavior, and the difference between wakefulness and sleep. All these phenomena are associated with the notion of consciousness, for example, one sometimes says that a mental state is conscious when it is verbally reportable or when it is internally accessible. Sometimes the system is said to be conscious of some information when it has the ability to react on the basis of that information or more strongly when it attends to that information or when we integrate that information and exploit it to the sophisticated control of behavior. We sometimes say that action is consciously conscious precisely when it is deliberate. Often we say that an organism is conscious as another way of saying that it is awake. So there's no real issue about whether these phenomena can be explained scientifically. All these easy problems are straightforwardly vulnerable to the explanation in terms of computation on neural mechanisms. To explain access and reportably, for example, we need only specify the mechanism to which information about the internal states is retrieved and made available for verbal report. To explain the integration of information, we need only exhibit mechanisms by which information is brought together and exploited by later processes for an account of sleep and wakefulness, an appropriate neuropsychological account of the processes responsible for organisms, contrasting behavior in those states will suffice. In each case, an appropriate cognitive neuropsychological model 
can clearly do the explanatory rope. So that's easy. So the really hard part of consciousness is the problem of experience. When we think and perceive, there is a rural or whir of information processing, but there's also a subjective aspect. Nagel, 70, 1974, put it, there's something it is like to be a conscious organism. The subjective aspect is, is experience. When we see, for example, we experience visual sensation, the felt quality of redness, the experience of dark and light, the quality of depth in the visual field. Other experiences go along with the perception in different modalities, the sound of a clarinet, the smell of a mothball. Then there are bodily sensations from pain, orgasm, mental images conjured up internally, the felt quality of emotion, experience of a stream of conscious thought. What unites all these states is that there is something it is like to be in them, and all of these are states of experience. It's undeniable that some organisms are subjects of experience, but the question of how is it that these subjects are subjects of experience is perplexing. Why is it that when our cognitive systems engage in visual and auditory information processing, we have visual or auditory experience, the quality of deep blue, the sensation of middle sea? How can we explain why there is something it is like to entertain a mental image or to experience an emotion? It is widely agreed that experience arises from a physical basis, but we have no good explanation of why and how it so arises. Why should physical processes give rise to a rich inner life at all? It seems obviously unreasonable that it should, and yet it does. If any problem qualifies the problem of consciousness, it is this one. It is the central st sense of consciousness. An organism is conscious. If there is something it is like to be that organism, and a mental state is conscious, if there is something it is like to be in that state, sometimes terms, terms such as phenomenal consciousness and quality are, are used here but I find it more natural to speak of conscious experience or simply experience. Another useful way to avoid confusion is to reserve the term consciousness for the phenomenon of experience using the less loaded term awareness for the more straightforward phenomenon described earlier. If such a convention were widely adopted, communication would be much easier. As things stand, those who talk about consciousness are frequently talking past each other. The ambiguity of the term consciousness is often exploited by both the philosophers and the scientists writing on the subject. It's common to see a paper on consciousness beginning with an invocation of the mystery of consciousness, noting the strange intangibility and the ineffability of subjectivity and worrying that so far we have no theory of the phenomenon. Here the topic is clearly the hard problem, the problem of experience. In the second half of the paper, the tone becomes more optimistic. So Chalmers, you know, nice overview of the theory. I'll give a little bit of what he, of his uh, theories on this. You know, people could read the paper on their own. Okay, so functional explanation. Why are the easy problems easy and why is the hard problem hard? The easy problems are easily precisely because they concern the explanation of cognitive abilities and functions. To explain a cognitive function, we need only specify a mechanism that can perform the function. The methods of cognitive science are well suited for this sort of explanation, and so are well suited to the easy problems of consciousness. By contrast, the hard problem is hard precisely because it is not a problem about the performance of function. The problem persists even when the performance of relevant functions are explained. Here, function is not used in the narrow theological sense as something that a system is designed to do, but in the broader sense of a causal role in the production of behavior that a system might perform. To explain reportability, for an instance, is just to explain how a system could perform the function of producing reports on internal states, to explain internal access, you know, so on and so on. You know, just uh, mecha mechanistic explanations. You know, skipping through. Higher level sciences, reductive explanatory works in a similar way. You want know, to explain the gene, for, exa for example, uh, we need to explain the mechanism that stores and transmits hereditary information from one generation to the next. To explain learning, we need to explain the way in which assistance behavioral capacities are modified in light of environmental information and the way in which new information can be brought to bear in adapting systems actions to its environment. If we show how a neural or computational mechanism does the job, we have explained learn learning. 
We can say the same for other cognitive phenomena such as perception, memory, and language. Sometimes the relevant functions need to be characterized quite subtly, but it's clear that insofar as cognitive science explains these phenomena at all, it does so by explaining the performance of functions. When it comes to conscious experience, this sort of explanation fails. What makes the hard problem hard and almost unique is that it goes beyond problems about the performance of functions. To see this, note that even when we have explained the performance of all the cognitive and behavioral functions in the vicinity of experience, perceptual discrimination, categorization, internal access, verbal report, there may still remain a further unanswered question, why is the performance of these functions accompanied by experience? The simple explanation of these functions leaves the questions open. And uh, you know, why does all the information processing go on in the dark? free from any inner field? Why is it that when, when electromagnetic waveforms impinge on the retina and are discriminating categorized by a visual system, the discrimination categorization is experienced as a sensation of vivid red? We know that consciousness experience does arise when these functions are performed, but the very fact that it arises is a central mystery. This is the explanatory gap, the term of Levine in 83 between the functions and experience, and we need an explanatory bridge to cross it. A mere account of the function stays on one side of the gap, so the materials for the bridge must be found elsewhere. This is not to say that experience has no function. Perhaps it'll turn out to play an important cognitive role, but for any role it might play, there will be more to explain explanation of experience than simple explanation of function. Perhaps it'll even turn out that in the course of explaining a function, we will be led to the key insight that allows an explanation of experience. If this happens, though, the discovery will be an extra explanatory reward. There's no cognitive function such that we can say in advance the explanation of the function will automatically explain experience. To explain experience, we need a new approach. Usual explanatory methods of cognitive science and neuroscience do not suffice. The methods have been deployed precisely to explain performance of cognitive function. Okay, so they have some case studies and uh, studies that have tried to work on this. Uh, he mentions uh, Crick and Coke again. And you know, flip through. I encourage people to read through it. You know, this is Bernard Baer, Cognitive Psychology. And, you know, different approach, the strategy to explain uh, explain something else. Researchers explicit the problem experience is too difficult for now and perhaps even outside the domain of science altogether. These researchers instead choose to address one of the more tractable problems, such as the reportability or the self-concept. Although I've called these problems the easy problems, they are among the most interesting unsolved problems in cognitive science. So this work is certainly worthwhile. The worst that can be said of this choice is that the context of research on consciousness is relatively unambitious, and the work can sometimes be misinterpreted. And the second choice takes the harder line to deny the phenomenon. According to this line, once we explain the functions such as accessibility, reportability, and the like, there's no further phenomenon called experience to explain. <coughs> Some explicitly deny the phenomenon, holding, for example, that what is not externally verifiable cannot be real. Others achieve the same effect by following that experience exists, but only if we equate experience with something like the capacity to discriminate and report. These approaches lead to a simpler theory, but are ultimately unsatisfactory. Experience is the most central and manifest aspect of our mental lives, and indeed is perhaps the key explendidum of the science of mind. Because of this status as a ex explendidum, experience cannot be discarded like the vital spirit when a new theory comes along. Rather, it is the central fact that any theory of consciousness must explain. A theory that denies the phenomenon solves the problem by ducking the question. The third option, some researchers claim to be explaining experience in the full sense. These researchers wish to take experience very seriously. They lay out their functional model theory and claim that it explains the full subjective quality of experience. The relevant step in the explanation is usually passed over quickly, however, and usually ends up looking something like magic. After some details about information processing are given, experience suddenly enters the picture but is left to obscure how these processes should suddenly give rise to experience. Perhaps it is simply taken for granted that it does, but then we have the incomplete explanation of a version of the fifth strategy below. You know, fourth, more promising approach appeals to these methods explain the structure of experience. For example, it is arguable that account of the discriminations made by the visual systems can account for the structural relations between different color experience as well as the geometric structure of the visual field. 
in general, certain facts about structures found in processing will correspond to an arguably explain facts about the structure of experience. These stra this strategy is plausible but limited. At best, it takes the existence of experience for granted and accounts for some facts about its structure, providing a sort of non-reductive explanation of the structural aspects of experience. And a fifth reasonably strategies isolate the substrate of experience. After all, almost everyone allows that experience arises one way or another from brain processes. And if it makes sense to identify the sort of processes for which it arises, so Crick and uh, Koch put their work forward as isolating the neurocorrelated consciousness. Justification of these claims require careful theoretical analysis, especially in experience is not directly observable in experimental context, but when applied judiciously, the strategy can shed indirect light on the problem of experience. Nevertheless, the strategy is clearly incomplete. For a satisfactory theory, we need to know more than which process gives rise to the experience. We need to account of why and how a full theory of consciousness must build an explanatory bridge. So this is going to be Chalmers' bridge, the extra ingredient. And I'm going to skip through some of those theories. I'm going to recommend that other people read it. And, uh, you know, we get the non-reductive non explanation. You know, so this is, there's a lot of philosophical backdrop to this. And, uh, you know, it'd be like a book on tape for me to uh, read all this structural coherence. And, uh, but I did like, I did want to see, um, you know, don't, don't want to get into Chalmers' speculative theory, but he gives a nice overview of the philosophy and the thought. I'll read his conclusion. And if anyone has the time, I encourage them to read it. If you read it and have comment on it, you know, feel free to comment on my video about uh, these papers. So the theory I presented is speculative, but as a candidate theory, I suspect that the principle of structural coherence and organizational invariance will be planks in any satisfactory theory of consciousness. The status of the double aspect theory of information is less certain. Indeed, right now it is more of an idea than a theory. To have any hope of eventual explanatory success, it will have to be specified more fully and fleshed in, out into a more powerful form. Still reflection on just what is plausible and implausible about it, on where it works and where it fails can only lead to a better theory. More exist, most existing theories of consciousness either deny the phenomenon, explain something else, or elevate the problem to an internal mystery. I hope to have shown that it is possible to make progress on the problem, even while taking it seriously. To make further progress, we will need further investigations, more refined theories, and more careful analysis. The hard problem is a hard problem, but there's no reason to believe that it will remain permanently unsolved. Okay, great. Got more than a minion here. Uh, I'm really glad people are enjoying this. You know, said in the, I've been studying this topic my whole adult life. And uh, you know, this is extremely important to me. This is uh, you know, the essence of uh, what I've spent my whole life researching. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy that I'm able to put this stuff out there and people have interest on it. I see a lot of common names. Tom, you've been joining me for almost all of these. Claire, thanks for joining. You're Robert Burke, Richard Gazzinia. I really appreciate you people joining me. I'll read through the chat later. Ether theory. Um, yeah, I mean, so I have a few more slideshows. I'm looking through. I have a lot more papers. And, you know, if I keep on getting people watching this and I'm using it for my own personal uh, study, I get my friend text messaging telling me he's also he's also watching. He was thinking of maybe joining, like to ask questions. Is you know he's good with computers. His educational level isn't necessarily that high in this matter. And uh, but I, I would like to have people join the chat and uh, you know increase and hopefully. I think I got like a week of stuff to put out just to you know to get the real overview of the modern theory, and uh, you know I said like thank God I have a lot of leisure time. I spend about six hours a day in study. And I've spent a good chunk of that, maybe 20, 30, you know, quarter of that in the, you know, this theory of consciousness and, and it's related. And I'm trying to get the science aspect down because, uh, 
yeah, I, I would like to talk about the soul and uh, and the esoteric subjects, but you know, I want to give this uh, backdrop of. Uh, You, what what do we really know currently now and uh so yeah i mean i'm not like a professor i'm not giving you a test as i said i've been studying this my whole adult life largely for my own curiosity like the main reason i've been studying this like for judaism like I, you call me a rabbi but i didn't really want to be like a rabbi community leader a pulpit leader I really just wanted to know for myself, you know, like I wanted to answer these questions myself. Who am I? What's the purpose of life? What does God want from me? And I like to create an intellectual community. You know, there's courses online, there's study techniques and methods, and I encourage people to go through that. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I got uh, people watching. I'm really, really exciting and uh, makes me happy to be doing this. It gives me encouragement to keep on doing it. So I'm going to re-enter a screen share and keep on going. I'm going to do a few more PowerPoints. And uh, just make sure it's working. Okay, looks like it's working. So open up uh, open up a few of these PowerPoints. Okay. Got five more PowerPoints here. So keep this going. Yep, using the little my vaporizer here, the mind you know, to talk about consciousness, the mind expansion technique. And uh you know like Here I'm, you know, I'm reading mostly from atheistic, non-soul talking type uh, understandings, and hence, you know, taking taking a puff, and uh, you know, maybe we'll talk about that more. So, you know, optics. We're going to see a huge role of the playing of, uh, you know, sense perception, specifically vision, is a lot of times the most uh, studied of the sense perceptions. Although, you know, say, so consciousness is going to um, stand on a uh, large part the understanding of how the senses work. And when we talked about trying to, for the people who are going to try to claim that science, that uh, consciousness arises from the brain, um, you know, most of the evidence around what the brain does is related to consciousness that, uh, Just get get these slides ready and get my chance of voice to rest a second. Okay, so let's look at um, brain imaging. Let me just uh, check and make sure the sound's working, and I'm going to go presenting those slides I just pulled out. Okay, I'm going to miss this event, my local synagogue on ethical and mindful relationships at the New Jewish Center near my parents' house. So let's go. Clinical brain imaging. And actually, you know, Lauderbur, I was at Stony Brook where Lauderbur was. So we look at uh, how do we know, how does science look and try to understand what's happening in the brain? And, you know, you got Paul Lauderbur. I think of the MBI, and it was actually, I heard him speak. I met Lauderbur. He came to Stony Brook when I was there, and that's where he had been working. In, in Stony Brook, in the chemical building, they have a little walled-off section that has 
where he uh, you worked at to learn about the use of cat of uh, CT of the CAT scans, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, inspect scanning and clinical practices, recognize key anatomical landmarks, and begin to recognize and describe the appearance of common disorders. So when you look at uh, you know this is obviously going to be from an evolutionary perspective. Here's the cost difference between a, a you know, CAT scan and an MRI, about three times as expensive. The MRI is 3D as opposed to two-dimensional. It uh, takes about three times as long. Advantage, you know, the CAT scan costs less, better access. Good visualization of bony structures and calcified lesions. It has poor resolution. Beam hardening artifact, limited views on the posterior fascia, and poor visualization of white matter disease. So examples of the CAT scan. Advantage of the MRI, good resolution, excellent view of the brain structure, three-dimensional, good gray-white differentiation, adjust settings based on characteristics of the lesion, good view of the posterior fascia, no radiation exposure, capacity for quantitative imaging. I mean, there's a lot to this. Like I studied advanced physics and I still don't understand perfectly how these things work. Um, you, but uh, you know, these are the methods that we use to look into the brain. Disadvantage, you know, MRI is a cost. Patients ineligible because of pacemakers, uh, claustrophobia, long period of time. the type of uh, particle, you know, to really understand how, how uh, this stuff works is pretty complicated and requires advanced physics. But, you know, so maybe we'll get more into that, and that is interesting to me. I've actually taken multiple courses on edX about how these machines work in the background in physics, um, but that's beyond the scope of today's lecture. You know, so we have the horizontal, sagittal, cor coronal, anyone who's taken basic anatomy, And you're weighted, different ways of an image. So MRI usually for lesions causing epilepsy, white matter disease, different types of inner injury. As where CAT scans are better for blood, for contrast, bone, calcium, metal. So I mean, here's CAT scans. You see the differential, clear differential between the bone and other structure. Um, God forbid, like uh, here's a gunshot wound uh, with uh, leaving uh, metal in part of the brain. So CAT scan, and a lot of our evidence for the brain is going to be, God forbid, these freak accidents. You have SPECT, different method of a CAT scan. And you get the four ventral axial views, different uh, you know examples of figuring out problems with people through this. And I'm mean, you know, gonna yeah, I'll slide through these quickly, but it's saying like when we terms how do we understand the brain? Um, it's tough, you know, it's tough to understand the brain. We could try to develop like a bottom up neural networks of how a few neurons work or top down for how the whole brain works and it's basically reliant upon these scans so you scan interpretation you have contrast or non-contrast uh you know abnormality shapes intensities signals these examples of problems And I'll be going over this for a little, you know, I'll probably be spending a full week on this. So people are really following this, you know, by the end of the week, um, you're going to have a really good understanding of how the brain works, sense perception, 
um, you know, what we know about consciousness. So yeah, I wanted to go over these slides to uh, you know, fMRI, you have bold fMRI, which measures regional differences in oxygenated blood, diffusion rated fMRI, which measures random movement of water molecules, diffusion tensor imaging, measures diffusion of water in different directions and is a good test for studying white matter tracks. MRI spectroscopy, which can measure certain cerebral metabolites non-invasively. And you use these to create 3D images. So, you know, saying that there's a lot of power of the CAT scan, a lot of information could be gathered, but when we come to MRI, we get these awesome 3D interpretation of what's going on. And okay, good stuff. We got a minion here. Yeah, yes, yeah, so there's a lot of information here. I'm going to add a table of contents, and I actually watched through all of my stuff yesterday, um, you know, two speed. And uh, I'm going to go over this one quickly because I have some papers on it, and I, I want to add a little spiritual stuff here. So here's the brain and consciousness from uh, Transcendental Meditation and studies on the effect of meditation on the brain activities. And it's from a uh, you know, Transcendental Meditation Seminar, Maharishi, um, you know, who has uh, the university, I think, in o Idaho or Oklahoma, you know, Sustainability, Recruited the Beatles, and, uh, you know, had, gives these mantras to people like, like Hare Krishna, but other mantras. And it's pretty popular, like Jerry Seinfeld, and a lot of famous people are part of the Transcendental Meditation. And they've actually, you know, they have a lot of Indian doctors and, and a lot of uh, wealthy and people, and they've tried to do studies showing the effects of meditation on the brain. I actually have some studies on that. So add a little spirituality into here from all this atheism. And you find Hinduism. I'm going to be talking quite a bit about Hinduism. And uh, you can see that in a lot of ways, Western thought in the thought on consciousness coincides most with Hinduism today, although I like Kabbalah, and hopefully we're going to start talking about the Kabbalah, which is, might even be more complicated than any of this material science type stuff. The wholeness. It is only a matter of being it. We need not to try to remember it. It is held on by itself. This is because the very mind is infused within it. This is cosmic consciousness when the mind completely saturated with the state of a pure being comes back to live in the world of sensory perception. All things are experienced as before, but not as before. Now the full inner state of being is lived. So Maharishi. And uh, you know, so these are this is an actual study that they did on people who have been doing transcendental meditation. And obviously they hold of a, of a soul and uh, you're know, trying like a, like the brain is a receptor to the soul or different understanding. So I just want to toss that in, they'll toss this in here that uh, there has been studies like this. Here's from the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 4, 38. Now for transcendental consciousness to become permanent and to coexist with the waking state of consciousness, it is necessary that the two states of the nervous system correspond to those Two states of consciousness should coexist. This is brought about by the mind gaining transcendental consciousness and the waking state of consciousness passing from one to the other. This gradual and systematic culture of the physical nervous system creates a physiological situation in which the two states of consciousness exist together simultaneously. So here's an example of electrical patterns after four months of... Uh, Transcendental meditation practice after eight years. Frontal brain coherence in the you know, broadband coherence, and we see the difference between uh, transcendental meditation practitioners and none. You know, Travis and Alexander in 2006. So Maharishi, the mind takes that direction, not thought practice. Not through practice. The practice is not needed to reach the goal. The practice is needed to drag the goal out of the transcendental area to the area of activity. So EEG research shows distinct EEG patterns during transcendental meditation practice, which are seen more and more during sleeping, dreaming, and waking with regular transcendental meditation practice. So 
So there's interview from a trend. More EEG patterns. So here's the study. 17 non-meditating subjects, 17 transcendental meditation subjects. Long-term study, average 24 years of transcendental meditation. Uh, brain functioning during simple choice and reaction times. And I, I've had a study, I've had study like this done to me. So first task, attention. You'll see an asterisk in the middle of the screen, then you'll hear a tone. As soon as you hear the tone, press the space bar as fast as you can. Second task, remain balanced. In this task, you see a number in the middle of the screen, then a blank screen for 1.5 seconds, and then a second number. If the first number is greater, press the left button. If the second number is greater, press the right button. And you can see the different patterns for the people depending on how long they've been doing transcendental meditation. Also, there have been studies on Olympic athletes like this. Management. Classical musicians. And you know, from this study, it showed actually long-term transcendental meditation. People actually had the highest uh, score of, the, of, of how they're doing this, and maybe we'll read through the paper. So experience of higher states is innate in the brain uh, physiologic, physiology. We only need to systematically develop these circuits through alternating the experience of pure consciousness and normal waking activity. So there you have it, a study on the effects of transcendental meditation. Hope you enjoyed that one. So I want I want to you know include a little bit of uh, you know a little interesting. So I have another one. You know, add a little more psychology. Here is studies on you know panpsychism of like some sort of global consciousness. So you know I I am going to get into more esoteric topics and we an overview of the science. So here we're going to talk about consciousness, observation, randomness, the presence of mind in the physical world. So it's international corroboration, 100 scientists, artists, friends, network of host sites worldwide, and they all connect to these electrical impulse readers to understand brain activity. So this, these are the machines that people hook themselves up to. And, uh, you know, different types of different types of machines, different experience experiments. Thousand random trials. So you know, just uh, scientific uh, data. You know, showing the extrapolation of data where things may appear random, but there's certain trends like order within chaos. And we will probably get more into chaos theory. It's related. You know, type readers that people could have for field uh, experiences. You know, what's considered deep engagement, a coherent group consciousness and emotion. So on the left, an example of numerous event, the shamanic healing ritual at Devil's Tower. And the right group chanting in sacred space of the Great Pyramid of Giza, in the inner chamber, and uh, you know, so you can see the change in uh, electrical readings during these spiritual um, experiences. So you know, the sum of the psychological test uh, combined with the spiritual. So interesting, and I do want to get more into this topic. So I'm just throwing some of this out here now. Global perspective. There could be, you know, non-localized. Could there be common brain patterns between people all around the world? Um, example, Princess Diana's funeral, global event, um, combined 12 independent random data streams, and it showed people all over the world um, had some sort of heightened uh, brain activity during uh, Princess Diana's funeral. So these are, you know, scientific studies that have been done. 
and you here's the world network you know people connecting all over the world to these readers people in the network trying to make sense out of random noise you know that this is complicated like chaos mathematical theory a dissection of these charts like maybe like Fourier transforms great stuff and eventually you could uh, make some patterns out of the data So if the cooperation of some thousands of millions of cells in our brain could produce consciousness, a truly singularity, the idea becomes vastly more plausible that the cooperation of humanity or some section of it may determine what Comte calls a great being. That, uh, you know, some sort of, uh, so these are going to be complications. And like we saw with the oscillation theory in like wave dynamics that we don't even know what makes up matter or we talked about structurally trying to uh, determine uh, what's going on in the brain and saying, you know, do we have to put it down to the level of atom? And we don't even know what's the most basic principles. You know, is light a wave or a particle? Is there really, is the physical world an illusion type thing? So we have these structural units that we base truth off of. And, uh, you know, for these ideas of global consciousness, um, there, there, there could be scientific uh, correlations to this concept of global consciousness. So there's been studies uh, correlating natural disasters with rise in uh, brain activity. Accidents and disasters also rise uh, with uh, you know some sort of global uh, um, you know people not even involved in their brain activity going up and down like there's some sort of psych uh, psychic. Uh, extra power that connects consciousness between people. Um, global emotion, 9-11, been studies that uh, corroborated uh, different brain patterns around the world of people, what happened during 9-11. Fifty-hour trend after the fall of 9/11, this uh, brain pattern on a global scale uh, seemed to be in place for about 50 hours. Say 9/11 was unique after about three years of data, looking at all types of people, and uh, this uh, brain activity data that 9/11, you know, the the peak in the five days of uh, activity was a unique event in three years. So further studies connecting brain, da brain damage with brain activity with world events. Here's Kumbh Mela in India, millions of people coming together. So hopefully we're going to get more into these studies, you know, as we look into more esotericism, that we're going to try to get more into these studies, you know, New Year's studies, compassion, And yeah, I did want to get some of this out there to you know, show that there, there are studies, there's a lot of scientific data on the paranormal, on consciousness, on collective consciousness, and whether we understand it or not, we could still, uh, you know, so this, from I'm showing you, they have seven years of data that they've been collecting on people. So I'm glad to put that out there and, uh, you know, just stuff to think about that we're going to hopefully in the next few weeks have more time to get into. Dave Martell, appreciate you joining me. And let's look at mathematical learning 
mathematical cognition, consciousness, and learning, more of the brain, different activities, different approaches to the same issue, and slowly, you know, keep on going through these presentations and reading these paper, we'll have this larger vision, you know, the framework, and then, you know, research more on it. So, you know, brain, I said, by the time we're done about, the, we're done with this, we're going to know quite a bit about the brain. You know, the neuron, the nervous system, whether it belongs to a human or a leech, consists primarily of a packle bundle of cables. Each neuron has an axon, a long cable that conveys information through waves of depolarization called action potentials. Each neuron also possesses a brushy, a bushy aberization of dendrites that receives the signal coming from the other nerve cells. When action potential reaches a synapse, the contact zone between one's neuron axon terminal, another dendrite transmit a mitter molecule are released in the, from the nerve terminal and tie onto other specialized molecules called receptors inserted within the dendritic membrane. This causes the receptors to alter their shape. They switch to an open configuration in which the channel opens through the cell membrane, letting ions flow into the cell very schematically. This is how nerve impulses crosses the barrier of the cell membrane and is transmitted from one neuron to the next. Since ions carry an electric charge, their movement across the cellular membrane and within the dendritic tree produces a very small amount of current. Each neuron thus behaves as a tiny electric generator. So building neural networks, consider a baby becoming aware of light from a com coming window. First, the baby perceives a distinct line of contrast at the edges of the window. Notice the what and where in window edge. In the room, later the edges that enclose the window to find a new object, the window itself, even later the spatial location of the window. Leaves the child to understand the window better. It lets light into the house. The child learns to move things closer to the window to see them better. Later the child may realize that seeing things better reveals physical relationships better. And from there it is a small step to the metaphor of casting light on ideas or shining light on a subject so that we can understand it better and become enlightened. Even later in college, perhaps the young adult may encounter a term enlightenment and connect his or her original insight with understanding a historical period in philosophy. As adults, we become aware of more complex ideas, identify new categories, and see new relationships through a lifetime of personal growth and development as we construct our own enlightenment of life. So neurons that fire together, wire together, so evidence that sleep allows for restructuring of neural networks. So you have an integrative cortex. So you have the sensory function and motor function and the integrative function areas. And sort of mathematics. So how do we, how does the brain do mathematics? Or as I postulate, the mathematics is a function of the soul, not the brain like from the Plato, platonic drop uh, backload, but what's the connection between mathematics and the brain? So understandings of what, you know, what lights up. So we showed in the sensor, you know, wh where, do, where do we have light lighting up when Pearson does mathematics in these studies in the fMRI and CAT scans? So calculation, there's on the prefrontal cortex, central resources that cannot be shared with other tasks, an effort, effortful process, deep focus, strategy choice, working memory, retrieval from the triple code areas, back associative integrated focus. We had the, the triple code of quantity code, intraparietal cortex, the numeracy, number comparison, proximity, judgment, approximation, quantity manipulation, such as subtraction, in the Arabic code, visual cortex, Arabic reading and writing, multi-digit calculations, and the verbal code, temporal lobe, left hemisphere, spoken comprehension and production, rote memorization such as multiplication tables. So 
You get idiot savant, often autistic, large memory storage, isolation allows focus, great calculators, numbers that personality, extraordinary devotion of time, all a passion for the subject, geniuses but a greater aptitude for patience. Neuroscience now thinks that the time and effort one dedicates to a domain modulates the extent of its representation of the cortex. Students need to understand that giftedness is a function of effort. This is particularly true in mathematics where students believe only certain people are born with mathematical ability. Frontal cortex integration and working memory. The integration of the frontal cortex involves the intention comb intentional combination of separate networks of neurons to solve puzzles. Working memory resides in the frontal cortex. In general, we can hold and manipulate no more than seven elements at a time. Working memory is the primary machinery for planning and problem solving. Remembered stimuli and working memory can disappear immediately if there is inference from secondary stimuli. So you have the reward circuit, perception of possibly rewarded, you know, dopamine driven analysis. What is consciousness? Collaborators and I have elaborated this from uh, Danaheen, uh, Consciousness in the Brain, Deciphering Other Brain Codes or Thought, 2014. Elaborated a theory we call global neuronal workspace. We possess the consciousness. We propose that consciousness of global information broadcasting within the cortex that arises from a neural network whose rays and data is the massive sharing of pertinent information throughout the brain. The philosopher Daniel Dennett aptly calls this the fame in the brain. Thus, consciousness has a precise role to play in the computational economy of the brain. It selects, amplifies, and propagates relevant thoughts. What circuit is responsible for the broadcasting function of consciousness? We believe that a special set of neurons diffuse conscious messages throughout the brain, giant cells whose long accents crisscross the cortex, interconnecting it into an integrated whole. When enough brain regions agree about the importance of incoming sensory information, they synchronize into a large-scale state of global communications, a broad network ignites into a burst of high-level activation, and the nature of this ignition explains their empirical signatures of consciousness. Although unconscious processing can be deep, conscious access adds an additional layer of functionality. Uh, the broadcasting function of consciousness allows us to perform unique, powerful operations. The global neuronal workspace opens up an internal space for thought experiments, purely mental operations that can be detached from the external world. Thanks to it, we can keep important data in our mind for an arbitrary long dura duration. We can pass it on to any other arbitrary mental process. Even complex operations linking perception to action can be unfold covertly, demonstrating how frequently we rely on the unconscious automatic pilot, oblivious to this boiling hodgepodge of unconscious processes, we constantly overestimate the power of our consciousness in making decisions, but in truth, our capacity for conscious control is limited. Much of the unconscious brain activity is like a council of statisticians using a Bayesian statistics to analyze incoming stimuli to work on a variety of problems. Nearly all the brain's regions can participate in both conscious and unconscious thought. Our unconscious perceptions use incoming sense data to impute the probability that colors, shapes, animals, or people are present in our surroundings. Our consciousness, on the other hand, only offers a glimpse of the problemistic universe, what statisticians call a sample from this unconscious distribution. It cuts through all ambiguities and achieves a simplified view, a summary of the best current interpretation of the world, which can then be passed on to our decision-making system. So unconscious arithmetic, subliminal pr uh, priming experiments, confirmed with observational MRI data, data that indicated the number of sense regions were activated, indicate unconscious extractions on a no number's meaning. So Freud was right. Consciousness is overrated. Consider the simple truism. We are conscious only of our conscious thoughts because our unconscious operations elude us. We constantly overestimate the role that consciousness plays in our physical and mental lives. There's mounting evidence that many of the mental activities that we consider hallmarks of conscious thought are really occurring at the unconscious level to include mathematics. There's now strong evidence that uh, Hadamard in 1945 is correct in his identification of the stages of mathematical discoveries, initiation, incubation, illumination, and verification. 
Initiation, conscious exploration of a problem, launches the unconscious mind on a quest. Incubation, unconscious mind vaguely preoccupied with the problem, but shows no conscious sign of working hard on it. Illumination, conscious solution miraculously appears in consciousness. Verification, consciousness alone effortful. Implicit and explicit learning. Putting it all together, ex explicit conscious learning, high energy burn, high focus, brain is cued to work on task or problem. Neural networks begin to be formed. Practice recues brain. Relevant neuronal networks are strengthened. Implicit learning, low energy, efficient burn. Learning is burned into the brain circuit and is now hardwired. Tasks now reside in subconscious and can be done without thinking. Okay, pretty deep stuff. Down to four people on that. So, been at this a while. I'm going to keep on going. Yeah, I'm sorry, a lot of dead air. But I'm going to keep on going because I'm largely doing this, you know, just for myself. So I appreciate people, uh, you know, joining. Hope they gain from it. And later I'll uh, add, uh, you know, the timestamp in the table of contents so people could, uh, you know, take as they gain. So, you, you know, I'm going to be talking a lot about vision in the coming days. So let's look at the, you know, more history of optics. So optics, prehistory, initial studies of optics and vision, particle, light treated as a stream of particles, wave, light treated as a continuous wave, quantum, light as a wave particle duality, modern, light even weirder than we imagined. So prehistory, Aristotle, Ptolemy, um, Ibn al-Hatham, you know, particle, you have Newton, wave, you know, Young, quantum, Einstein, and the modern. So Aristotle, Euclid, Ptolemy, light and vision were concepts essentially independent but interwined. Inter vision is affected by form which comes from the visible object to the eye. From Aristotle, Ptolemy, and Euclid, vision is affected by a ray which issues from the eye to the physical object. Ibn al hathiyam Islamic scholar, Born in Iraq, Basra devoted his life to theology, but grew frustrated with sectarian arguments. Discovered the works of Aristotle as a young man, devoted his life to the study of the physical world. Studied and eventually commented on works of Aristotle, Euclid, Archimedes, and Ptolemy. Appointed a vizier to the Basra government, but was dismissed for the job by either feigned or actual mental illness. Possibly wrote more than 200 works, 50 still surviving. First description of the scientific method. Studied optics, astronomy, geometry, mechanics, water clocks, medicine, anatomy, business, arithmetic, and civil engineering. So we mentioned the Islamic Renaissance, the golden age of Islam. Um, Al-Qazimi, the Arabic numerals from Hindu mathematics. Al-Qazimi, algebra. Abu Jafar, the house of wisdom and the translation of Greek text into Arabic, and where you see the precursor of European wisdom, a lot of it relies on this uh, Islamic Renaissance. So he is in Cairo by the Mad Caliph. Wants to uh, damn the Nile. He says it's not possible. And he has mental illness. During that time, he writes his book of optics, seven-volume book on vision, the anatomy of the eye, Light propagation, reflection, or refra refraction introduces rectilinear propagation of light. Light travels in straight lines from object to eye. Sight does not perceive any visible object unless there exists in the object some light which the object possesses of itself or which radiates upon it from another object. It's the first to make the seeming, seemingly obvious connection between light and vision. First to observe that the brain is the center of vision, not the eye, and introduce the distinction between primary and secondary sources perform the first non-trivial demonstration of the camera obscura. So what's the camera obscura? The geometrical optics. We can demonstrate that light passing through a small pinhole into a darkened room forms a reversed image of the object. Naturalists prior to al Hatham had observed this type of effect, uh, but none had apparently studied the phenomenon systematically. 
Use multiple light sources. Demonstrate that light followed straight line paths through the hole by screening one light source. Another was able to demonstrate that the image was inverted on passing through the hole. So Hatham's conclusion experiment was not done to demonstrate imaging, but rather the non-interaction of light rays with one another. All the light that appeared in the dark places have reached it through the aperture alone. Therefore, the light of all these lamps have come together at the aperture, then separated after passing through it. Thus, if lights blended in the atmosphere, the lights of the lamps meeting at the aperture would have mixed in the air at the aperture, and they would have come out so mingled together that they would not be subsequently distinguished. We do not, however, find the matter to be so. Rather, the lights are found to come out separately, each being the opposite of the lamp from which it has arrived. So his books of optics remained one of the most influential optics books throughout the prehistory period. It was translated into Latin and influenced Roger Bacon. So now we have the corpuscular aerial era of light, about the 1600s. Basis of geometrical optics had been established, uh, Snell's law, Fermi's principle of the least time. Um, Hygens publishes... Uh, the Trite de the Luminaire, suggesting light is a wave phenomenon. The Newton, finally, 1704, optics firmly cemented the corpuscular particular theory of light for the next 100 years. And then transition to the wave era. Thomas Young published his famous double slit experiment, demonstrating the wave nature of light. However, the result was not immediately recognizable. An explanation of diffraction was proposed as the subject of the 1818 Paris Academy Prize question. Uh, Frenzel explained the diffraction based on wave theory of light. Poisson argued against it, stating that the theory would lead to a bright spot behind an opaque disk. Arago experimentally found that spot, the Arago spot. It was Arago, French physicist. Fundamental contributions to optics, the Arago spot, the Frenzo Argo laws, the stellar aberrations. 1830, he was a liberal, uh, active uh, liberal Republican in French politics, and his influence and guidance helped spur many scientific discoveries. In 1806, he went to Spain to perform meridional measurements. He was accused of spy. Okay, interesting uh, history. Speed of light, measurements of the speed of light have been first made by Romer in 1676 through uh, the moons of Jupiter like the Doppler effect, stellar aberration, the combination of finite speed of light and the motion of the Earth leads to stellar aberration, a phenomenon in which the starlight appears to come from different directions at different times of the year, first observed in 1725 by Bradley. And so with this aberration, they were able to estimate the speed of light. So we have Newton, theory of refraction, Light particles reflect because they speed up in matter. You know, Snell's law, Arago's experiment with light refraction. Arago found that the light from every star is refracted by the same amount. This result seems to be with the first aspect in manifest contradiction with the Newtonian theory of refraction since a real inequality in the speed of the rays, however, does not cause any inequality in the derivations which they test, it even seems that one can return of its reason only by supposing that the luminous events emit rays with all kinds of speed, provided that it is also admitted that these rays are visible only when their speeds lie between given limits. On this assumption, indeed, the visibility of the rays will depend on their relative speeds, and these same speeds determine the quality of the refraction. The visible rays will be always also refracted. So the conclusions, Newton's particle theory of light completely failed to explain Arago's experiment. A wave theory of light seemed the only possibility. 1818, Frenzel suggested that the ether, the hypothetical medium in which light travels, is particularly dragged along with a material medium. We let Arago to embrace the wave theory of light, widespread belief in the ether. So wave theory of light. So a lot of history here. Maxwell, theoretical foundation, light is an electromagnetic wave. Hertz, experimentally demonstrating electromagnetic waves. You have Amper and Faraday, 
um, the relationship between electricity and magnetism. X rays, 1875. Rontgen, discovered by accident after two short weeks of experiments. The first X ray for the photograph was produced of the human body using his wife Anna as a test subject. Rays produced when high energy electrons collide with an anti cathode in a cathode ray tube. This is a coser tube. So, physician organ of X ray was not immediately clear when, you know, how do they understand this? Uh, so, you know, Barclay, British physician who worked as a professor of natural philosophy in Edinburgh, worked with x-rays, x-ray spectroscopy, the excitation of secondary x-ray waves, won the Nobel Prize. Wilberforce's idea of polarization would be a good indication of the electromagnetic nature of x-rays. However, ordinary methods of polarizing light do not work for x-rays. They shoot right through polarizers, and because they don't spec spec uh, specularly Reflect Brewster's angle doesn't work. So Professor Wilberforce suggested to Bark Barkla that one could use the secondary radiation as a polarized source and scattering the secondary radi radiation produce a, territory, a tertiary beam of radiation which should have a dipole behavior. Did the experiment and get the results. As the bulb was rotated around the axis of the primary beam, there was, of course, no change in the intensity of primary radiation in that direction. There was, however, a considerable charge change in the intensity of the secondary radiation in both the horizontal and vertical directions, one reaching a maxima when the other attained a minimum. By turning the bulb through a right angle, the electric scope, which had previously indicated a maximum of intensity, indicated a minimum, and vice versa. The position of the bulb when the vertical Secondary beam attained a maximum of intensity. The horizontal secondary beam, a minimum, was that in which the cathode stream was horizontal. The maximum had a minimum being reversed when the cathode stream was vertical by turning the bulb through another right angle so that the cathode stream was again horizontal but in the opposite direction to that in the other horizontal position. The maximum and minimum were attained as before. So you have Einstein, special theory of relativity. Detailed studies in the behavior of light particles was somewhat hindered by the lack of quality light source in your quantum mechanics. Uh, Paul Dirac, in the principles of quantum mechanics in 1930. Sometime before the discovery of quantum mechanics, people realized that the connection between light waves and photons must be of a statistical character. What they did not clearly realize, however, was that the wave functions gives information about the probability of one photon being in a particular place and not the probable number of photons in that place. The importance of the distinction can be made clear in the following way. Suppose we have a beam of light consisting of a large number of photons split up in two components of equal intensity on the assumption that the intensity of the beam is connected with the probable number of photons in it. We should have half the total number of photons going into each component. If the two components are now made to interface, we should require photon in one component to be able to interface with one and the other. Sometimes these two photons would have to annihilate one another, and other times they would have to produce four photons. This would contradict the conservation of energy. The new theory, which connects the wave function with probabilities for one photon, gets over the difficulty by making each photon go partially into each of the two components. Each photon then interferes only with itself. Interference between the two different photons never occurs. So in 53, Towns soon produced the first microwave amplifier based on the principle. You got Mandel, pioneers in the field of quantum optics, which has led to such speculative ideas as quantum computing, quantum cryptography, and quantum teleportation. The so inference of independent beams, inference requires in essence that the wave fields being in interfered have a definite phase relationship with respect to each other. Two inter independent lasers will fluctuate independently of one another and on average will produce no discernible interference pattern. Note the clause on average in the, is the absence of interference 
just an artifact of the averaging process or a true manifestation of direct statements, interference between two different photons never occurs. Classically, two quasi-monochromic waves will still will stay in phase for a finite period of time during that time. It should be possible to see an interference pattern in between them. So Meiger and Mandel's experience, 63, two light beams from two independent ruby masers are aligned with the help of two adjustable 45 degree mirrors and superposed on the photocathode of an electronically gated image tube. The tube is magnetically focused and the image produced on the output fluorescent screen is photographed. And I remember carrying out such experiments when I was studying physics in university. So the quantum plot thickens, Mandel, they repeat the experiments with very low intensity light sources with high probability only one photon is present in the detector at any time. They still found an interference pattern, surprising as it might seem. The statement of Dirac quoted in the introduction appears to be as appropriate as the context of the experiment as under the more usual conditions of interferometry. So meta era of optics have changed the focus from what is the behavior of light to how can we make light behave how we want it to. So you know, this one's pretty pretty intense. So uh, you, know, you really want to understand consciousness. You got to understand uh, sense perception. And optics is a huge thing. You really focus on vision or sound and sound waves. Vision is probably one of the best sources of uh, sense sensation, sense perception, and hence... Uh, the high level of need of uh, of vision. So did I do all these? Let me just check. Sorry, my voice is getting tired. I want to cover a little bit, a few more things. Just delete these, clear the room from my space. As you can see, I had uh, more stuff. <laughs> I brought more PowerPoints out. It's a you know marathon stream already. Um, so let me do two more studies, quick ones. Another book just shipped. Just order another book. Facebook. Missing an event to do this, but that's okay. So I got two studies here on chanting. You know, I mentioned, uh, so here's one from 2003 and another one from 2008. Here's spectral analysis of the Vedic mantra Omkara. That was uh, Hindu University of America in Orlando, Florida. It has been recognized for quite some, add this to the chat. And I'll add the timestamp and table of contents later. So I'm going to do these two studies and probably finish it up. So hopefully, shows me I got five people watching. Doesn't tell me who. So let's look at the spectral analysis of the Vedic mantra Omkara. It has been recognized for quite some time that mantras or sacred words have beneficial effects on human beings and even plants. In a previous study, the authors had demonstrated the effect of Agnihorta mantra chanting at sunrise and sunset on the germination of rice seeds. Scripture also mentions that mantras like Om Gayatri have benefited humanity quite a lot. This paper is an attempt to quantify quantitatively the signal characteristics of mantra sound patterns. It is a pilot study and appears to be one of the first of its kind in the world. The study has confined itself to the identification of predominant frequencies in their subharmonics of Akara, Ukara, Makara, and Omkara. So, you know, we talked a lot about optics and the sound wave propagation is similar in the, you know, the different uh, sense perception and, you know, spirituality. So since time immemorial, there's been a belief that sacred words and their combinations called mantras have beneficial effects on human beings, animals, and even the plant kingdom. This belief has been so widespread that practically every scripture refers to it in some way or another. Extensive details regarding the meaning and significance of mantra and their use in daily life are available from uh, Gina Davy. Recently, some investigations have been carrying out the effect of chanting of uh, 
Agni Hotra Mantra at sunrise and sunset. Controlled experiments in that ritual performed according to scriptural injunctions that a remarkable effect on the rate of rice seed germination. So let's look at the literature overview. Since the time of Lord Raleigh in the beginning of the 19th century, there's been a lot of interest in studying the effect of music on the human system. It is only recent that interest has developed in extending this work to mantras also in 1981 conducted the effect of mantra meditation on the electroencephalograms of experienced meditators the results were inconclusive conducted similar study in the effect of meditation training on hypertension here too the study showed modest reductions in blood per pressure but the results again were inconclusive in 1994 experiments in the effect of ohm meditation on middle latency auditory evoked potentials of 18 male subjects. The results indicated that the experimental group showed an increase in the peak amplitude of a uh, sodium wave where there was a significant decrease in the control group. They extended this work in 1998 with the experimental group meditating on ohm and the control group meditating on a neutral word one. Mental repetition of ohm showed a significant decrease in skin resistance levels on the experimental group as against the control group there was also reduction in the heart rate and the rate of breathing and takashashi conducted a pilot study in 1999 on the effect of low frequency noise on the human body vibration they showed that the low frequency noise affects the health of individuals depending on the structure of the body the frequency range used by them was 20 to 30 hertz which is quite below the frequency of normal human voice perhaps the most interesting study and the most relevant for our current work is the Uchida in Yamamoto, the effect of sound forms on the germination of seeds, which showed that a sinusoidal vibrations of the rate of 40 to 100 hertz had a significant effect on the seed germination. The increase of the rate of seed germination dependent upon the frequency and was noticeable in the range of 70 to 100 hertz. So here's another study on wave vibrations in the Ohm Mantra and encourage people to read the whole report. Here's the computer generation of the amplitude of a, a female and male voice saying OM. So let's look at the discussion. The most important figure from which useful results can be attracted are the figures five and six. They are frequency time spectra called spectrograms, representing the peak of the energy frequency spectra as a function of time. In these figures, no energy levels are indicated. However, direct bands represent predominantly high energy regions, and the white patches represent almost zero energy. The level of gray color is an indicator of the relative levels of energy. So here are these again, five and six. Spectrograms are used to separate the characteristics of the voice from those of the words. The lowest frequency, which is the bottommost line in these figures, include, indicates the pitch, which is a characteristic of the voice since the male voice has a lower pitch compared to the female voice. It also had a lower fundamental frequency. In the present case, the ratio of the fundamental frequencies of the male and female voice is about 1 to 2, which is the usual case. The male, case, the male voices in the present case have a, also a larger number of sub subharmonics than the female voices. So a detailed study of the spectrogram showed that the two male voices had a fundamental frequency of 108, 118, the corresponding values of the female voice, 237 and 242. And the, so a more interesting result in his effort, ohm, the signal has two segments, starting with the O and the gradually tapering off to the M. From the point of view of the intonation and the shape of the cap cavity of the mouth, the sound O is in between the sound A and U, this was clearly seen in all four figures for ohm, in which only two are presented in figures five and six. The male voice shows nine subharmonics in the region of O and two in the region of M. In the case of the female voice, there are four for subharmonics for O and one in M. Thus, it is clearly seen that the sound pattern for O in all cases lies between those for A and U. In the second segment, all sound patterns agree with those recorded earlier for M. There is internal consistency in the data, which testifies to the authenticity of, and reliability. This is 
look at these charts again for people to understand this. Uh, and then we'll read the conclusion. It has thus been possible to identify the fundamental and subharmonic for the sound patterns A, U, Ma, and Om according to the Sanskrit pronunciation. Where is the work of this type useful considering the two investigations referred to earlier, Gina Devi, Uchida, and Yamoto? Those two were done almost at the same time but independently of each other, but a comparison between them is almost impossible because the sound patterns used by the two groups cannot be compared. It is only when the spectrometers are properly analyzed and the sound characteristics properly identified does the comparison become meaningful by recording the sound patterns and extracting their frequency characteristic. One can identify that frequency which has the most noticeable effect on seed germination, and only then does a comparison become possible. It is proposed to analyze in a future study the Abnorda mantra spectrically and to use this information in germination studies. Interesting, you know, just a basic overview, down to four people here. So I'm just gonna do one last study, get the stuff on my page. And uh, this is another study on the same topic of uh, time frequency analysis of chanting Sanskrit divine sound Om Mantra. Our effect, our attentiveness and our concentration are pilfered from us by the proceedings take place around us in the world that it's in recent times. Different challenges and impediments are faced by the people You work in the software industry. It's tough to handle the stress that sometimes, therefore, to come out of the aforementioned troubles. Meditation is essential for all human beings. In the, in the same time, for psychological stress, speech signals is uttered to be a considerable indicator in the direction of mediating human subject. Om is the spiritual mantra outstanding to fetch peace and calm the entire psychological pressures and worldly thoughts are taken away by the chanting of the Om mantra. Elimination of disruption and introduction of new dynamism in the body are given by the Om chanting. The consciousness could be promoted through the repetition of the Om mantra. Furthermore, this mantra transcends the restrictions of a mentality to systematically understand the meditative chant, termed the divine sound Om, is the endeavor of this research with a wa wavelet transport time frequency analysis has been carried out for the divine so sound Om. By this analysis, we could conclude steadiness in the mind is achieved by chanting Om. Hence, proves the mind is calm and peace to the human subject. Current advancements in technology and rising workload is often accompanied by stress. As a result of few physical factors in certain occupational actions, the psychosomatic complications termed psychological stress occurs to incorporate spiritual welfare in step with our substance welfare meditation provides as a way highly sensitive expressive experienced people are more probable to be satisfied and efficient in their life in recent days it turns out that simultaneously they cannot give concentration and think discursively whether in the medical or technological or social spheres to develop our excellence of life human venture has sought all down the ages promoting the quality of our life and mind together with our material standard of living is essential to improve our quality of life so you know, just the backdrop on meditation. Meditation induces a state of relaxation and the altered state of consciousness, particularly efficient in psychotherapy. For psychological stress, speech signals uttered to be a considerable indicator. The speech signal expresses the information enclosed in the vocal word. As with several real-world signals, speech signals are non-stationary, hence the frequency contents change diagonally with time. Four analysis is unconvincing. Speech signals possess processing refers to the acquisitional manipulation, storage, transfer, and output of human utterances by a computer. The main goals are the recognition, synthesis, and comprehension of human speech. Speech signals are including the features such as temper, physical characteristics, and added pragmatic information. Most of these characteristics are audible as well. Concerning 25% information enclosed in clean speech signal refers to speaker. 
through abstract psychological procedures, speech production initiates the aspiration to communicate and the thought that is to be communicated. There are quantities of human verbal communications that are effectively non-linguistics, even if speech is an oral action, which is greatly verbal, tone of voice, excellence, uh, prosody, rhythm, and pausing are the nonverbal characteristics for a nonverbal signaling system. These phenomena stand, which interweave with the verbal or linguistic system. In the midst of supplementary things, information about the physiological and psychological conditions of the speaker is carried by the nonverbal content of the speech. Since undoubtedly perceptible nonverbal actions typifies human behavior, they are capable of identifying dissimilar states. Our mind is entirely permitted to focus and give attention extra on sound by the repetition of the mantra. So when you look into uh, the theory of using the mantra or chanting is that the body and mind begin to resonate with the frequency of the voice, helping to organize thoughts and consciousness. Reciting a mantra continuously purifies the speech and protests the mind by maintaining a constant spiritual connection. And of course, it helps to disperse mental chatter. If there's no religious preference for the sound vibration, OM is a universally recognized mantra. The sound OM is considered, is called uh, pranava, meaning that it sustains life and runs through prana or breaths. The OM is composed of the letters A-U-M. They symbolize the practitioner's impure body, speech, and mind chanting. Uh, chanting OM will bring us to the state of purity in, in body and mind and soul. The chanting OM mantra drives away all worldly thought and removes distraction and fuses new vigor in the body. Modern science has to reaffirm that Om Mantra chanting allows her mind to focus and clear away unnecessary thoughts, sensations, and distractions which divert her energies. In this paper, by using signal processing techniques, Om Mantra chant signals analyzed to endorse its effect on consciousness and steadiness of mind. The time frequency analysis is performed by the Om chant signal using wavelet transforms. Our analysis results confirm that the chanting of the Om Mantra will improve our consciousness and give steadiness to mind by clearing all worldly thought. Papers organized as follow. So introduce the concepts and techniques utilized to propose this work. The steadiness analysis of the OM chant signal is discussed in detail in section three. And the analysis results are given in the section four. Section five concludes the paper. So the concepts, you have mantra, OM mantra, Time frequency analysis is the al analysis of body of techniques for characterizing and manipulating signals whose component frequencies vary in time, such as transient signals. Time frequency analysis finds its roots in Fourier analysis, where a signal in time can be analyzed in the frequency domain as a sum of sines and cosines. For a stationary, non-stationary signal such as speech, the standard Fourier transform is not useful for analyzing the signals. Information which is localized in time, such as spikes and high-frequency bursts, cannot be easily detected from the Fourier transform. We have used wavelet transforms for the time frequency analysis and approach. So discrete wavelet transformation, the wavelet is a smooth and quickly vanishing oscillating function. With good localization, both in frequency and time, the wavelet transform is a technique for analyzing signals. It was developed as an alternative to the short time Fourier transform to overcome problems related to its frequency and the time resolution principles. A discrete wavelet transform is any wavelet transform for which the wavelets are discretely sampled. Discrete wavelet transform provides high time resolution and low frequency resolution for high frequencies and high frequency resolutions and low time resolution for low frequencies. And that respect is similar to the human ear, which exhibits similar time frequency resolution characteristics. So st steadiness analysis of the Ohm mantra So chanting that goes back uh, from time immortal. Uh, be semi-mathematical, the procedures used here. I encourage people to read through it. So the details, the results of the analysis prove that the steadiness of mind is attained by chanting ohm to avoid disturbances due to ambient noise and other sound Sources of sound, a professional recording was preferred. Therefore, a professional recording of the divine sound chanting OM was attained and used for further scientific investigation. Hence, the professionals may possibly not be affected by the stress, the need to analyze their speech signals unnecessary. So during the OM chanting process, our mind focuses on the repetition of the OM chanting. Moreover, this practice helps us to reach steadiness. The frequency of the chant 
signal. Figure one represents the initial chanting owned by a normal person. And the achievement of steadiness, calm and peace to the stressed mind. The mental stress of a person gets reduced while the mind reaches steadiness. In addition, concentration also improves. Here's someone chanting after a few days. Here's using these higher and uh, these other wavelet transforms. So conclusion, our tenderness and our concentration are pilfered by the events around us. Different challenges and impediments have been faced by the humans due to the, their occupational activities. Meditation is essential for human beings to come out of the above troubles. Om is a spiritual mantra important to obtain peace and calm. The entire mental pressure has been taken away by chanting Om mantra. Consciousness has been improved by the repetition of Om mantra. In this work, we have confi confirmed the significance of Om chanting. The time frequency analysis has been carried out using wavelet transforms for the divine sound Om. We've included that Om chanting affords steadiness of the mind scientifically. This provides calm and peace too to the stressed mind. The mental stress of a person gets reduced while the mind reaches steadiness. As a final point, we've confirmed scientifically the accomplishments of Om chanting and reducing the stress for the human mind. So, Mr. Gujar, thank you. Pretty interesting. I don't know if Dave Martell is here. Yes, if you're watching Esoterica, Martell is a pagan. Um, he said that on my channel. You could check it. I think uh, I've, been, I've been at it a while. I think I want to do... I want to do this one on Hinduism, this nice overview um, on from the Hindu America Foundation on uh, Hindu thought. You know, so I have the I already prepared this, so I'll do this today. And uh, you know, we'll see. We're talking about Om and chanting, and uh, these days Eastern thought is probably the most influential on studies of consciousness, probably even more so than science. So, you know, darshana, the experience of spiritual sighting or vision, thousands of schools of thought in Hinduism, darshans, like uh, you usually when you go into a Hindu temple and you see the deities, that's called darshan. You know, go get darshan, go look at the deities or be seen by the deities. So, the six most influential systems of Hindu thought, nyaya, uh, vai via Shika, Sankhya, Yoga, Mimamsa, and Vedanta. So Nyaya, the logical approach, Nyaya insists that nothing is acceptable unless it is in accordance with reason and experience. To reason, Hindus rely on the following four sources of information, uh, uh, Pratyaksha, uh, Numana, Upamana, and Shabda. So perception, any data gathered by the sensa, Senses, inference, conclusions based on the available data, comparison, understanding something unknown through its similarity to know something, and verbal authority using the words of enlightened seers. So there are some examples of uh, reasoning. You know, atoms cannot coordinate themselves into an intelligible universe but there are signs of purpose and planning everywhere one looks. Therefore, there must be an intelligent will, your God guiding the force that directs these atoms, adrishta. So Vaishekya, the atomic theory, the reality of the physical world and beyond, this darshana aims to scientifically represent the diversity of the universe without losing any particulars. Boiled down to seven categories, substance, quality, action, generality, particularity, and adherence, non-being. Substance, I looked more closely, you know, nine matters, earth, water, light, air, ether, time, space, the soul, and the mind. Matter, the atom is the most basic element of matter, indivisible, eternally, and externally tiny. The combination of atoms makes the physical world 
as we experience it, an unseen but extraordinary force called Adrishta controls the formation and subsequent disintegration of the atoms that make up the world. The force is controlled by the will of God. And God and matter in uh, Vay Vayasheshika, while the atoms are in the material cause of the world, God is the intelligent cause. However, God is not the creator of the atoms. They are co-eternal with him. Through the lens of this darshana, suffering is due to ignorance of the true nature of beings, especially the self, and liberation is affected when true knowledge dawns. So you have Sankhya, spirit and matter. Many scholars consider this one of the oldest systems of thought in the world. The, say, the system was founded by the sage Kapila. It was strongly atheistic and forwarded many arguments against the existence of a god. The word Shankya means number. Shankya delineates the categories that constitute reality, both physical and mental. 25 categories that constitute reality. Five physical elements, subtle elements, organs of actions, sense organs, and the free faculties of mind. And you divide it into matter and spirit. Uh, Prikti, matter, and spirit, Purusha. And the three faculties of mind, you have manas, thought processes, senses of self, Ahankara, senses of judgment, booty. So the physical elements, earth, water, fire, air, and space. The subtle elements, felt, heard, tasted, touched, seen. Uh, organs of action, excrete, procreate, move, handle objects, speak. And sense organs, smell, taste, sight, touch, hearing. So the manas, the thought of the process, the brain does not see and hear. It registers stimuli and lets the manas process it all. So Ankara, the awareness one has of themselves. Booty, decision-making ability, and it is what separates a human from an animal. And Purusha, the real, the, the real self, exists outside of everything above and is distinct from matter. So Purusha is the one piece of this puzzle that is conscious and eternal, and the mind is a tool for the Purusha to interact with the world. Yoga. Techniques for high awareness focuses on quieting the mind through the eight-limb system. Ashtanga Yoga, as described in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, for a balanced life and ultimately moksha. Yoga means union and is focused on separating the self from its false identification with matter. It is a practical branch of the Shankya philosophy and the spiritual techniques espoused move one from talking about higher levels of reality to experiencing them. You have energy, prikti or energy is manifest in three modes, the gunas, the rajas, the tamas, and the sattva, motion, inertia, harmony. When all three gunas balance each other, the materiality of the universe fades away. Yogis try to balance the gunas within themselves through diet, exercise, and lifestyle, religious, spiritual practice, so that they can disengage from matter entirely and merge into a pure consciousness. When this is achieved, the burden of karma falls away, leading one to moksha, liberation. So mamamsa, the way to heaven, mamamsa emphasizes the performance of duty as the law that binds together families, nations, and the universe. It takes no strong position on God and includes both theistic and atheistic variants. The ancient sage uh, Jaimini is credited with the this darshana, which complements Vedanta. So the way to heaven, those who favor this darshana spend every waking moment conscientiously performing religious duties. They focus here as performance of sacred ritual. So one lives righteously on earth and obtains a heavenly state post-death, ending the cycle of samsara, birth and rebirth, is less important than living ethically in the present. So way to heaven, followers see the universe as an unending sacrifice. Life is offered to a creature who dies to feed another and so on that one must align themselves with. Though the goal of early Mamamsa writers seemed to have been the attainment of heaven, Svarga, the prevailing philosophical concerns regarding the liberation and moksha, seems to have influenced the later Mamamsa writers to write on the subject and accommodate their school's view within it. Opposed to the heretics, later Mamamsa thinkers were forced to provide philosophical justification for their school's views, which led to the schools producing many logicians. And finally, Vedanta, from fleeting to external, Vedanta literally means end of the Vedas and is focused on the teachings of the Upanishad. It relies primarily, primarily on transcending one's identification with the physical body for liberation. This means which an individual can transcend one's self-identity through right knowledge, meditation, devotion, selfless service, good works, amongst other religious and spiritual disciplines. Vedanta is arguably the most influential of modern Hinduism. 
So Vedanta sub-schools, you had Advaita and the Vishitha, Advaita, the Dvaita. The major sub-schools differ in their views of the nature of Brahman, the soul and the universe, and the path to moksha liberation, and the nature of moksha, and so on. So Advaita, according to the Shankara, the main exponent of the Advaita Vedanta school of thought, Brahman is the one, the whole, and the only reality. Everything else, including the universe, material objects, and individuals are maya, or name form manifestation. Brahma is often described as neti neti, meaning not this, not this, because of the limits of language. It is more accurately described as what it is not. Within the school, there is no separation between the Atman, the individual soul, and Brahman. They are only they are one and the same. So Vishta Advaita, Ramanuja is the foremost exponent of the school. The perception of Brahma is the infinite, omnipresent, omnipotent, and corporal transcendental reality from the Advaita lens applies to the Vishata Advaita approach as well. The Atman is seen as dependent on Brahman. The soul can experience union, but not unity with Brahman. Ramanuja Charya emphasized the importance of rituals and love of God. So like the Hare Krishna movement, Lord Chaitanya is similar to Ramanuja Charya, um, but looking at Krishna as opposed as the source of Brahman. Dvaita, Madhava rejected both the Advaita points of view and preferred this school, the Vedanta of duality. Through this lens, the world is seen as real humanity is real and God is real. However, each is eternally separate. There is no union or unity with Brahman. So key takeaway, Darsharnas are the schools of theology or Hindu ways of understanding the nature of God and God's relation to existence. There are six main darshanas. Many Hindu teachers are not interested in the differences in the darshanas because they believe that individuals, each individual's unique experience of divinity is all that matters. Hindu believes that anyone who follows their dharma or duty while bringing their karmic balance to zero is capable of attaining moksha liberation and finding the divine regardless of what name they choose to call the divine by. Uh, that one's really good. I'm, I'm glad to get through that one with the stuff on Om. We got seven people. Yeah, that that one on the Hindu one, Hinduism was pretty good. So I, I guess I've been at it for over three hours now, three and a half hours. You know, great stream. There's so much more to do. You know, I, I see, see all these tabs still on my window, and uh, yeah, I'm enjoying doing this as long as I'm getting views and people are enjoying it. I'm probably going to keep on doing this, you know, maybe every day, every other day. And, uh, you know, it's very useful in my own studies. I'd probably be using this method even if uh, I wasn't posting it on YouTube. And, you know, just to help my own memory for my own research, the main reason I do this is really my own curiosity. And, uh, yeah, yeah, so uh, hopefully we're going to be able to create some sort of uh, global community and you know try to understand the esotericism and look at these concepts like uh wave energy and global consciousness in relationship to uh you know did the internet create something new or is the internet just a technology that is enabling us to tap into something that always existed this global consciousness um you know if you look from more material explanation and we're going to get a lot more into the hinduism and uh, possibly kabbalah and i got whole slides ready on like the history of christianity and thoughts and esotericism because in my opinion the esotericism is actually more complicated than the than the science but the esotericism should fall into a scientific background they should be scientific they should uh, make sense to a scientific minded person and we should take a somewhat um And we should take a scientific approach to it. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I'm enjoying doing this. And, and uh, you know, sometimes it's tough to talk and talk and talk. And uh, I'm glad people are enjoying it. I'm glad people are participating. Hopefully we're going to get more of a community around this. We'll be other people that are thinking about the same subjects and we'll have more talks. And, you know, as a learning method, you know, just to ingrain these ideas in our head and so that we could use the correct terminology and understand the current state of research so that we're not uh, making too many assumptions or we're not inaccurately describing phenomenon and not playing different word games. So it's important to get through this basic uh, period of research, and I'm enjoying doing it. So uh, I think that's all I'm going to do for today. I appreciate everyone watching. I hope they're learning a bunch from it. 
and uh, you know, so I'm watching over these videos. You know, I, I saw you know, people saw my Hare Krishna chanting. I do Hebrew chanting. I chant uh, Vedic mantras. I'm a believer in the spirit worlds, but I'm essentially a scientist in nature. I believe in faith and trust in God. You know, so I'm peace out. I'm not going to do too long of a monologue, and uh, you know, there's a lot to do. I'm going to review this, add the timestamps and the table of contents as usual. So if you want to come back and review just certain segments of it, it's not just going to be this like huge multi-hour stream that you can't, uh, where you'll be able to look in the in the description and there'll be a timestamp table of contents and you could go straight to uh, the presentation because I did about 20 different presentations here and you know a few papers and I got a lot more to do. I'm going to keep at it. So I appreciate you people tuning in. And so peace out, shalom, Hare Krishna, Om. And uh, you know, hopefully this will be beneficial to you. Please add in the comments if you have collaborating research or comments or questions. And if uh, you know, one of you wants to have the courage to come on to one of these streams and uh, you know, for more intellectual discourse and try to really flush out these ideas so that we'll understand them better, you know, we say that uh, the words leaving your own mouth is possibly the single best way to understanding. So, you know, visually reading, mentally you're reading, hearing something, but when the words actually leave your own mouth, it's been shown that that's probably the single best uh, nature of learning something. So, uh, you know, having something explained to you, then explaining that to someone else is when you really start to solidify it. So even if it was just me talking to myself and videoing it and listening later, but to have commentary in uh, how these ideas come across and th these are largely like reviews and it's just a public study session and hopefully in a few weeks when I've uh, went through the data so you see what's out there the current state of knowledge the historical backdrop the differentiation of the different fields of knowledge and how they come together well I'll be able to start adding um, new research new understandings and push progress forward and hopefully uh, my channel will be a beacon to people with thoughts on the subject oh. hey Verbo thanks for tuning in, you know, say a lot of you guys, you know, might be bigger, better streamers than me. And uh, I think you, that's going to be the benefit of these streams that, uh, you know, I've spent most of my adult life in research. I spend about six hours every day studying. So there has to be the communication between the orators and the researchers. So I'm just going to put it out there. So as of now, I'm not quite ready to put out my own conclusions. And I'm probably going to, it's probably going to be a week, maybe 10 of these like three hour sessions um of of this going forward and as i said you know they may not be interesting to people to watch all the way through i, I mean I, I find it interesting i watched these myself through just to review but i will time stamp and table of contents them so you could just look at the interesting parts so peace out shalom appreciate everyone tuning in hopefully i'm going to do this again tomorrow um maybe about the same time tomorrow but uh you know it's hard for me to plan right now and as you saw in the reading uh, speed reading where it was recommended to do it the same time every day. So I hope a few of you went through the speed reading uh, lecture and you, where we actually analyzed the scientific evidence on speed reading with the um, different techniques and methods. And that hopefully some of you are, you will be uh, using these speed reading strategies and we're actually increasing our IQs and intelligence. And, uh, you know, so, you, um, see people keep on tuning in. You know, get more people listening to listening to me than the presentations and in uh yes i do want to create this intellectual community i do want to create a community of intellectuals around these topics and you know that was my point about diversity and multiculturalism because i find these things interesting so can it be like okay because we disagree about multiculturalism that we're like we can't be friends we can't create a community around uh researching these common fields of interest or, you know, because I'm a Jew and someone else is a Christian or an atheist or a, um, a pagan or whatever, that we can't put our heads together to push further research on these issues. And as I showed, the benefits of multiculturalism actually is largely in these intellectual pursuits where you have different people from different perspectives. So how do you get to the heart of consciousness? You see, you have the Hindu uh, perspective, Christian, Judaic, uh, atheistic, scientific, and putting all these perspectives together is more likely to lead to truth and uh, bringing minds together from different people. You know, so if you have an interest in the subject, I don't care what your background is or your belief system, 
you just put forward your useful knowledge on the subject and will increase. Um, yeah, and it could be from the power of the internet, you know, saying like you maybe you want to live in a segregated area of people around your own type. The studies on uh, diversity, multiculturalism did show that there's higher dispute and more problems with breaking communication barriers when you have multiculturalism, although the benefit is in pushing forward intellectual ex excellence and creative thought patterns. So, you know, the internet, you know, so even if you do want to live in your own private uh, place and have mostly friends of your own type um, or a healthy, uh, healthy mix, that uh, the internet is that great forum. Because, yeah, it could be that if we met in public, there would be too many conflicts of interest and we wouldn't be able to have this forum of just talking pure intellectualism. And thank God for YouTube and the benefit of technology. So I guess if anyone wants to come on, I'll even put the link in the chat real quick. I'll wait a minute or two and see if someone wants to come on and talk about this. Otherwise, I'm going to close up because I see I got hit more people watching than I was doing the stream. And so... You know, someone wants to add some insight into this or the future of research. I had thought about, I'm not sure if I'm going to do JF again. He, he'd mentioned maybe we do again this week, but we didn't schedule it. I thought maybe a topic to discuss with JF with his bigger audience, because obviously I'm, I'm, it doesn't pay to keep on the same disagreement, was be pushing forward scientific uh, research, coming together to form meeting of the minds and uh, creating intellectual communities through YouTube and these shows and possibly like the concept of the crowdfunding where people are paying money to further research and maybe like political things, conspiracy theory, different things that affect politics. Um, and, you know, so I want to target an audience. I'm not just going to, uh, um, you know, having a big audience doesn't, doesn't really benefit unless it's targeted to the interest, and especially, you know, it's, you know, so, so, uh, but I, I do like, the, and it could be that very few people really have uh, interest in this field or, or the background to, you know, to really understand consciousness. You really need to know, you know, master's level understanding of multiple different fields, philosophy, science, biology, physics, uh, you know, history, religion, all of these things come into play to understand the nature of consciousness. It's probably possibly the single most complicated subject out there. Like I did in real estate, uh, I worked in construction management, and you say like land development is the most complicated uh, pinnacle of all things because it involves all the other, you know, things like planning, construction, business, economics, public policy, politics, uh, social science, uh, social theory, urban planning, all these things come together to making good uh, real estate development and maybe stock trading, you have to actually financially Cap, make uh, capitalize off of uh, the, this knowledge to predicting which companies are going to go in, in the future. So, uh, you know, hopefully other people are researching this and I guess no one wants to come on. So it's a long stream and, uh, you know, so I'll let people move on and hopefully do this again tomorrow. So Shalom. Excellent. Appreciate everyone joining me. Um, blessings.